I would like to welcome all the members who are participating by video conferencing and to remind members about the protocols regarding the use of electronic devices. So, no apologies have been received in advance of the meeting to the committee office. I'll just check with the clerk. If we... No other apologies, no other Chair. Apologies. Okay, members. So, we're then going to move into our first substantive session today. And the first session is a joint meeting with the Disabled People's Parliament and a briefing from the uh, Department of Health. So, members, this is the first joint meeting of the committee and the Disabled People's Parliament. And I would like to welcome those delegates from the Parliament with us in the chamber. It's, uh, I feel, a very important, a very historic day, and, but also a very um, natural day in, in, in a sense of the terms of, of how this committee have uh, operated since, since the outset. From the outset, we stated that we would want to be a very inclusive committee, a committee that reached out to people who uh, have solutions, have, have knowledge of their particular area and expertise, and we wanted to access that expertise and to ensure that that expertise was part of the discussion around health. So we are delighted to have your expertise and your experience with us today. We're delighted that the, that the department have facilitated a panel of officials to take questions from you, and we are delighted that the minister is here today to present and to take a few questions as well. Um, so it's it's a it's it's it's. It's, it's the outworking of, and, and I'm particularly delighted to have to say, the very first APG that I attended here in, when I became an MLA was the, the APG for disability, or the APG for disabled people. And actually, three of the five people who are here today, Michaela, David, and Amanda, I think we're all at that meeting. But I think it's, it's a nice way to sort of, towards the end of the mandate, to, to see this event taking place today and to see the important work that we are hopefully going to achieve here today being completed in, in that sense. So thank you for that. So I'm going uh, to first of all introduce the, uh, the the members that we have with us from the Disabled People's Parliament. We have Amanda Paul, David Macdonald, on Starleaf. We have participating Joanne Sampson, June Best, and Michaela Hollywood. So at the special session of the committee, we will be getting briefed by the Minister of Health, and officials are available to answer any questions. We are also delighted today, and I think it's a very important and and. Uh, significant moment is we are being the meeting will be signed by British Sign Language signers. Unfortunately we weren't able today to get availability to have Irish Sign Language possible during the meeting live, but we have we will endeavour to get an Irish Sign Language uh, interpretation signed version done as soon as possible and we will put that out publicly as well for people with with uh, with uh, who, who use Irish Sign Language. So, I would now like to go ahead and welcome the Minister and his officials from the Department. So, first of all, Mr Robin Swan, MLA, Minister of Health. Robin, can you hear us there okay? I can, Chair, yes, thank you. Thank you. Gerard Cassidy, Director of Primary Care in, uh, in the Department. Gerard and Will too, uh, can you hear us okay? So, we're not hearing you there, Gerard, just... Um, I'm not sure if you can check your sound. I'll move on and, and we'll come back to you. Hopefully, when we come back to you, we will be able to hear you okay. Mark McGookin, then, Director of Disability and Older Person People. Are you able to hear something, Mark? Good morning, Chair. I can, yeah. Thank you, and we're seeing and hearing you, Mark. Thank you. Colin Dunlop, Head of Physical, Sensory and Disability. Colin, can you hear us okay? Okay, I'm not seeing or hearing Colin. I'm going to move on, and we well, I'm going to move on. And we'll come back to you, Colin. Hopefully, we'll be able to hear you when, when we come back. Jim McComish, Deputy Principal, Physical, Sensory, and Disability Unit. Jim, can you hear us? Chair, I think some of my team are having difficulty getting on, so maybe if we could just introduce them as they get on, if we need to. Yep. Okay, and we okay. will then also be hearing from Jerome Dawson. Are, are certainly available to take questions, and Jer Jerome is Head of Learning Disability Unit, and Andrew Webb is Head of Elderly and Community Care Unit. So I'll go, uh, and we're also sorry, joined by Ryan Wilson, who's a Director in Secondary Care. So I will then go ahead back to yourself, Minister, and ask you to go ahead and brief, brief the meeting this morning, please. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Chair, and look, thank you for the, the opportunity to join uh, with your joint meeting this morning. Uh, with those members of the Health Committee and also the representatives from the Disabled People's Parliament. Um, 
I'm very pleased to be invited here today to deliver a few opening remarks. But unfortunately, due to other pressures, I'm unable to, to be with you in person or, or to stay for the full session. Um, but I've made a, a wide range of my officials available today who will be able to, to continue the engagement with both representatives of the Disabled People's Parliament and, and the Health Committee. And I commend your committee chair for facilitating the attendance of members of the Dis Disabled People's Parliament um, here today. I think this joint event actually underscores um, and acknowledges the very important role of the Disabled People's Parliament and what it has in representing the views of people with lived experience of disability. Um, actually focusing on the person first and their condition or, or disability second and actually furthering the rights of, of disabled people in Northern Ireland. Uh, and I wish I was with you yesterday, Chair, when, when you updated, or sorry, I was with you yesterday, Chair, when you updated the, the speaker in regard to today's event uh, as a follow-on from the previous meeting that he'd actually hosted. Um, I, I understand and, and fully uh, and place great value on the benefits of, of co-production and co-design of services, actually working closely with people living with a disability. Um, so, so, for example, in, in late 2021, my department established a regional disabled people's forum for health and social care, which is bringing the views of disabled people, carers, the statutory sector and, and the voluntary community sectors actually closer to government. And it's that forum that provides feedback at a strategic level um, to my department on current, new and emerging policy initiatives. Uh, which contributes to improving the experience and outcomes of people living with a disability in Northern Ireland. But due to the pandemic, the last few years, sorry, Chair, I'm starting to get feedback. Okay, there's no feedback in the room. Um, so, okay. yeah, you're, you're still clear to us. Okay, no, enough. that's all right, Chair. Uh, so, so due to the pandemic, the last few years have been extremely challenging for all of us. Uh, and in particular, the, the, the most vulnerable members of our society. Children, the elderly and, and disabled people, including those who were clinically vulnerable, uh, have endured significant personal challenges as they actually strive to live their lives safely throughout the pandemic. And my department and the health service have sought innovative solutions to the challenges of delivering our services with primary, secondary and social care and it's in a safe a manner as possible during the pandemic. <coughs> and I want to acknowledge fully the importance of making all our health and social care services, and that includes primary care services, accessible uh, to disabled people. And I understand that whether primary care services uh, are delivered remotely or face-to-face, -face, it's very important that we take the necessary steps actually to enable them uh, and enable every patient to be able to access them. So for disabled patients, this may mean ensuring that our primary care services are able to make use of appropriate support services and technologies. technologies. So looking to the future, it, it's crucial that we work together to ensure primary care services are able to deliver high quality, accessible services for everyone in Northern Ireland. And in order to address the longer term pressures of increasing demand for primary care services, my department has been continuing uh, to invest in our, our GP workforce. Uh, we've increased the number of GP trainees by over 70% since those 2015 levels. And work has also recently commenced on a review of GP trainee places to make sure there are enough GPs to meet our primary care needs uh, into the future. So everyone here today is aware of the key role played uh, also by our domiciliary care workforce and helping to enable people to live independently in the community. But demand continues to, to outstrip supply, and providers have been experiencing difficulties with staff, retention and recruitment. And of course, the, the recent progression of Omicron cases still means that a, a number of staff are, are off sick or isolating. But there's no doubt that the number of people awaiting access to suitable care arrangements is still too high. So in recognition of those pressures faced uh, by the sector, I announced a funding support package of up to £23 million in November, and that was for the independent domiciliary care and wider social care sector, and that was with the aim of facilitating increased capacity uh, across the sector. 
the aim of that funding was to enable employers to offer improved terms and conditions, uh, training and career progression opportunities, and rates of pay, which should assist in addressing some of the immediate issues. And it is hoped that this will provide an incentive to those wanting to stay within the sector and indeed uh, actually attract new staff to the sector with the aim of, of increasing capacity. The additional funding has already been utilised by employers uh, to enhance uh, to offer enhanced rates of pay and better terms and conditions. And it's that funding package that has currently been rolled out. Uh, it does not extend to personal assistance employed through direct payments. However, I am considering if there would be scope to address the position of personal assistants who are extremely important as part of our care system. Because I recognise that the way things have been done up until, up until now is no longer fit for purpose. And a new approach is very much overdue, both in terms of how we deliver domiciliary care, but also how adult social care as a whole is delivered. And it's on that basis, £800,000 was allocated to the Health and Social Care Board uh, for 2021. And that was in order to test pilots and new ways of service delivery as part of our wider reform of adult social care. The majority of the funding was provided to the Southeastern Trust to support the rollout of their new pilot for a new model of domiciliary care. And the Southeastern Trust model could potentially be adopted as a template or, or model for the region, depending on the outcome of that pilot. It moves away from a, a time for task model towards an outcomes model, whereby people get access to a more flexible service. So the work of the reform of adult social care will actually inform the long-term reform of the sector. And that includes domiciliary care as well. And as you know, Chair, uh, a public consultation on the reform of adult social care was launched on the 26th of January. And that public consultation sets out our proposals for reforming adult care and support uh, and making significant system change. Also, Chair, something that, that you, you've uh, continued to, to push and ask questions on is that of adult care, short breaks in health and social care transport because we know they were among the essential services that have been greatly impacted by the pandemic. And it's fully understandable that many people have been calling for the full reinstatement of these services, but it should be equally recognised, however, that these services are subject uh, to nationally agreed health protection guidance designed to keep service users safe. Uh, and as community transmission of COVID-19 still remains high, there are high rates of staff absences and that results in the temporary reduction or, or closure of adult daycare and short breaks to respond to pressures in acute services and supported living. But again, my department is liaison with trust to ensure that the pressures are addressed and placement breakdown is avoided. So while there have been significant advances in how we live with the virus, remobilisation of services presents increased risk in terms of COVID-19 transmission. It's not possible to fully quantify the COVID-19 risk to increase respite services each service user and setting presents a varied level of risk. However, it's recognised that partial service delivery is impacting the physical and mental health of vulnerable adults and carers. That's why I approved the pathway for remobilisation of adult daycare, short breaks and transport back on, on Monday the 31st of January. And my officials uh, are working with the health and social care trusts uh, have been with them to direct full implementation of that pathway. And trusts will be required to upgrade, re up to actually outline the time frame to fully restore daycare, short breaks and transport. The review and pathway will be published uh, on my department's website and the formal review of the implementation of the pathway will be undertaken within three months of inception. So, Chair, moving on to our COVID-19 vaccination programme, which follows the advice and recommendations of the Joint Committee on Vaccination and Immunisation. All vaccine clinics uh, should be capable of accommodating anyone with a disability. All our leaflets and materials are available via the PHA website and can be viewed in larger print or using JCVI. Or using JCVI will continue its rolling review of our vaccination programme and that epidemiological situation, uh, particularly in relation to the timing and value of doses for those considered to be at lower risk, and we intend doing that ahead of autumn 2022. Safe and 
equitable access to hospital services is, also, is of course, of vital importance to disabled people in particular. And the Belfast Trust ha has had a proactive uh, disability steering group actually since 2008, and that comprises a, a broad range of trust staff, disability representative organisations and disabled people. This has helped us to work in partnership to bring forward innovative um, and inclusive uh, initiatives to improve the experience and promote independence of service users, patients and staff with, with a disability. And this has really just been a, a brief overview of the work to date within the health service and beyond as we endeavour to make our, our health and social care services as safely accessible as possible to, to our people with disabilities. Uh, plainly, Len, you know, a lot of work has been done, and there's still plenty more to do. So once again, I would like to extend my appreciation, Chair, to everyone here today who is in, engaged with my department and the wider health service, and that spirit of, of crew production. And as Chair has pointed out, I, I, I'll hand over to, to my official, Mark McGuckham, who's our Director of Disability and Older People, uh, who will respond, I think, more fully to questions uh, that members of the Disabled People's Parliament have. Uh, already shared with us, and uh, as you indicated, and Andrew, just, uh, there's a wide range of officials here today, and they, uh, of course, will be happy to take questions from committee members uh, as well. Uh, Chair, I hope that you've had a, a, a cons I hope you will have a constructive uh, conversation today, and, uh, and I thank you for that. But Chair, as I spoke to you this morning, I, I'm content to stay for for a few minutes and take questions if that's if that's helpful for you on the the Disabled People's Parliament at this stage. Okay, thank you, Minister. Thank you for that briefing, and thank you for um, uh, taking. So, in in light of that, what I will propose then, I'll just go uh, directly to the delegates from the Disabled People's Parliament, and I have an order list here. So, I'll go to those in order. We'll get a couple in, and you can indicate, Minister, uh, at what point uh, you're handing over to Mark. But I'll go first of all to David. Then, David, go ahead, please. Thank you very much, Minister. Welcome. Um, good to see you again. I, I want to address. Um, the issue of the independent living fund. It was good to hear you talking about the value of personal assistance, um, because especially in these times, personal assistance keeps me safe. And I'm just wondering where we're at with the independent living fund. As you know, financially, legally, socially, and collectively, the independent living fund works. Financially, it gives a startling social value return of £10.89 for every £1 invested. Legally, it accords with Articles 10 and 19 of the United Nations Convention on the Rights of People with Disabilities. That is the right to quality of life and the right to independent living. Socially, it affords the most disabled people in this country freedom to choose and control our own lives, freedom to determine and decide what to do, when, where, how to do it, and with whom. Freedom to live a life worth living. Collectively, currently, current stakeholders, future stakeholders, organisations often for disabled people, and all the trusts agree to it. No. Will you commit to reopening the Independent Living Fund to new applicants by the end of this mandate? Minister. Thanks, David. I had difficulty picking up some, some of that, Chair, unfortunately, but I uh, haven't engaged with David on, on many occasions. Um, I know fully his, his, the point that he'll be making in regards to the value of, of the Independent Living Fund uh, and the support it brings to people with disabilities, but also how he has advocated greatly for it, uh, uh, not just uh, during my time as Minister, but also in the engagements uh, that he had had with Richard Pengelly as permanent secretary prior to uh, the re restoration of the executive back in, in 20, uh, January 2020. In regards to being able to do anything in the remainder of this mandate, David, I, I cannot give you that commitment, and you've known me well enough that I, I've never made a promise that I, I'll not stand over. But we do, uh, in the department, value what it has done and what it has been able to, to do. Uh, I only wish I was in a position uh, where today that we could be looking to a, a three-year budget for the new executive and any successor in this place um, after the next election could be making those commitments with the guarantee of an increased budget, but also the surety of, of a three-year budget as well. 
Uh, in regards to where we stand with the Independent Living Fund Chair, I'm sure Mark or some of the other officials can pick up in more detail uh, at a later stage, if that would be suitable to you. Yep, yeah. If, is, are you okay? We'll, we'll, yeah. we'll come back for some more detail on that, David. Um, do you have anything, a, a follow-up or, or...? Another question, maybe? Yeah, go ahead, David. Um, Minister, can you hear me clearly now? I'm just checking... Take your mask off. No. Can, we, can you hear me clearly now, just to...? David, I actually think it's my connection rather okay. than anything from that side as well. So if you keep going, I, okay. I, I'll no will work. Um, sadly, it appears that some domiciliary care providers, private domiciliary care providers, are leaving disabled people that they have contracted to deliver services to, absolutely adrift and alone, contacting the trusts. <coughs> Excuse me, contacting the trusts and cancelling packages they themselves chose. The results are an added burden to the trust and uncertainty and fear for the disabled people concerned. With the only option on offer going into a nursing home. In November last year, as you said earlier, we allocated an additional £23 million, intending, intended to help such private providers increase their workforce and improve their practices. Given the current climate, and this allocation of additional funding, can the Department and Trusts act to ensure private domiciliary care providers do not drop packages and people, at least until alternatives in the community have been identified and secured? David, um, in regards to the additionality they were provided, part of our concern back in November and December last year was actually the, the high number of packages that independent providers were actually indicating they were going to have to hand back because of staff shortages and staff pressures. And that was where I suppose part of the major concern was coming to us uh, as a department, but also the trusts who were then feeling, uh, and, and rightly so, were obliged that they were going to have to pick up uh, those packages as well, where they didn't have the capacity either. When we introduced the additional 23 million to support the independent sector in regards to, uh, as I spoke about, the ability to, for them to increase wages, terms and conditions, but also career progression as well, we saw um, a significant downturn uh, in those packages that were going to be returned or actually stood down. So we did see a stabilisation of what the independent sector were able to provide. So we didn't see the, the, the mass uh, continuation of return of, of domiciliary care packages that could have happened had we not intervened uh, in November with that additionality of money as well. We're still aware of, of some, some challenges as well, and that's why we're compensating uh, with the additional capacity within our trust to make sure that we, we are getting those packages for those individuals. But as I said in my opening comments, David, uh, demand currently outstrips the supply that we have in regards to complete domicile recover that what we want to provide as well. And that's why, you know, the pilot that we have running in, in the South Eastern Trust, I think really sets a model um, for what domiciliary care could look like in the future, because we know it has to change. We know the demands um, of uh, the number of packages that we have, the people who want to stay in their own homes receiving the support as you spoke about earlier in regards to that through domiciliary care package or independent living fund or personal assistance payments. You know, it's all important that we make sure that we're providing a system that suits the needs of the person rather than suits the needs of the system. I, I think, if I may, I think that's part of the difficulty because it's meeting the system's needs and the private provider's needs. Um, it's also why I'm concerned about the ILF and indeed direct payments, but the ILF in particular because the Independent Living Fund has seen an awful lot of people safe through the pandemic because people were able to close their doors and stop domiciliary workers coming in who maybe had more chance of, of passing COVID on and look after their own and have a level of money to fund PAs to do so. I think it's essential for future proofing that we have that available to the most disabled people in this society because it is the most disabled people that, that are affected by this. And we need to work assiduously, if I may say, um, yourself and future ministers to try and get this through. It would be nice to see a consultation come out on the Independent Living Fund before 
uh, the end of this term. Um, I trust we can maybe try and work towards that. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank, thank you, David. And I'll move on then to Amanda. And if I could just ask everyone, all, all attendees, that uh, we have someone with visual impairment, so I'd ask the speakers okay. clearly identify who they are before, before speaking and before answering. So, Amanda, go ahead, please. Hi, June. It's Amanda. Just let Thank me. you, Amanda. Okay. Um, Minister, one of the issues prior to the pandemic and even more so currently, is getting a timely appointment to see a GP. Perhaps a way to overcome this problem, and I'm just setting this as a little seed, would be for GPs to be paid in a completely different way. At the moment, they're paid per patient that they have on their books, whether they see them or not. Would it not be an idea to actually pay them per appointment? then appointments would come flowing in, I believe. Okay. Um, I'd like to ask what plans are afoot to work in co-production with disabled people to address the issues that we have with primary care. And can you advise me when GPs will open their practices to enable appointments to be booked? GPs were the first ones to close their doors and it seems like they're going to be the last ones to reopen if they ever do. Thank, thank you. Amanda, um, Minister, please. Um, th thanks, June. Uh, Garog Cassidy, my Director of Primary Care, is on here. He'll be able to get into to greater detail in regards to the specifics of GPs. Uh, June, I think you've just suggested this, this morning a, a complete rehaul of our National Health Service and how we, we operate with our GP. So I'm not sure I'll be able to get that done by the end of this mandate, but I know it's something that uh, has been long looked at. And when I go back and, you know, people, when they, they know my politics, when I, I look at the National Health Service that Nye Bevan uh, wanted to create back in the 40s, it was the complete system. Uh, GPs at that point weren't uh, brought into the system uh, as fully as they could have been in the National Health Service. But I... I know there are conversations happening in other places about how that greater integration works. Uh, June, in regards to sorry, your, your Mr. comments Mr. about... Just, sorry, Minister, there's, there's a little bit just of confusion there. It's Amanda, actually, um, that was sorry, asking... Amanda, sorry, yeah. okay. apologies. Yeah, but, You're yeah, okay. but, you, you, you confused me at the start, Chair, but that's I, all. Blame the Chair. I'll pass blame the Chair, Minister. I, don't, don't, more, <laughs> don't worry, Chair, I will, because she usually blames me. Uh, and I, sorry, <laughs> I, apologies, apologies, Amanda. Um, and look, in regards to the challenges that we've had with, with uh, the accessibility to GPs, uh, sometimes I think uh, criticism that, that is levelled to them is unfair. Our GPs are uh, actually su supporting an increased number of referrals uh, to what they were previously, even pre previous pandemic as well. Our GPs are open. They are doing things differently uh, in some cases. Uh, but even talking to our GP representatives bodies, they're not all not um, they're all being tired with, with the same brush, unfortunately. And I've visited a number of GPs who have went far and beyond in regards to what they're actually doing to open up their services and making sure they're fully accessible to the people who need them. Uh, we invested uh, significantly towards the end of last year in regards to our GP services to make sure they could be more accessible in regards to telephone triage uh, and uh, enabling people to actually get in contact with them uh, directly. Um, our GP services uh, need more investment, both in regards to financial input, but also how they can be modernised as well. And that's why our multidisciplinary team approach, uh, which was started, uh, it's important that we get the continued funding to be able to do that funding, not just from a workforce uh, capacity point of view, where we can bring in those physiotherapists, pharmacists, social workers, actually into GP practice, but also the capital expenditure they need as well to increase uh, the physical footprint that they need to see that wider scope of patients and provide that greater service as well. So there's a lot of work to be done again in, in our GP models. Our GPs are up for it. Um, but it's in regards to how we actually do that. We've also looked about increasing the number of GPs and GP training places. We've increased that significantly over the past number of years, but like the other challenges that we've seen in workforce, 
it takes time for those those numbers actually to get through and those individuals to get through their training. So in the medical school that was opened last year in, in McGee, we'll see more practitioners coming out, hopefully more GPs under the practice as well. And as I said in my you know, opening comments, we've increased the number of GP trainees by over 70% uh, from our 2015 levels. Those changes don't result straight away in, in more appointments, more accessibility. But it's about investing now to, to redirect some of the underinvestment that we've seen over previous years. Thank you. Chair, I'm getting tight, tight in time here, so I know you have a couple of other questions just to get in before. Yeah. So um, I'll go then to June. Um, June, go ahead there with your question, please. Uh, um, thank you, Chair, and uh, thank you, Minister, for giving us the time. Um, many disabled people still feel unsafe. They are still taking steps to um, uh, protecting themselves from COVID. They make choices if and when they go out. Um, but what about um, being, being safe in their own homes? Last week, I had two callers uh, in the same day. Uh, one was a telephone engineer and the other um, was someone to read my electric meter. Neither were wearing masks and face coverings. Um, I couldn't see, but I did ask. Right. Um, I guess that um, with public health me me uh, with measures uh, that are currently in place to protect what what currently are in place to protect people in their own homes um, and situations. When utility workers, engineers, housing executive staff trust staff, and in some cases domiciliary care staff, think that, P uh, that COVID is over and they don't uh, need masks or PPE. And what is appropriate PPE in these circumstances um, and in homes when uh, they know that someone is uh, clinically extremely vulnerable? Thank you. Thank you, June. Um Thanks, June. Just you, you read out a, li a list of, of individuals, June, I, I, and I think you mentioned domiciliary care workers not wearing PPE. Yes. Um, I'd Stop. be keen if, if you could uh, offline maybe pass either through some of the committee clerks as well uh, to get back to, to my officials so we can address that. Domiciliary care workers should be fully aware of their PPE requirements if they're providing a service to someone in their own home as well. I'll not go into the individual details, if you don't mind, just on this call, but it's something Absolutely. that, that I, I'd be keen to, to, to follow up on because we have protocols that they are required to, to form as well. In regards to those other utility users uh, coming into someone's home who is ex ex clinically extremely vulnerable, uh, they should be wearing face coverings. Uh, and the, the I suppose that the utility regulator, uh, if they have employees who have certain conditions or requirements where they, where they can't do that, should be making um, those who can utilise full PPE uh, and wear face coverings uh, accessible for those homes that have CEV residents possible. There, there's a register out there, and I'm sure you're aware for anyone who is clinically extremely vulnerable or has requires um, additional uh, acknowledgement for the use of electricity services and things like that would be flagged. It. But it's something, June, to, to, to be perfect in regards to other utility regulators. It's not something that has been raised with me before now, but certainly something that I'll get uh, officials to follow up on after this meeting, or you can have a, a wider conversation with those still on the call after, unfortunately, I have to leave. Thank you. Thank you for that, Mr. Thank Can you. I uh, have I time to do a second question? Or? Briefly, please, June. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Um, disabled, disabled people are still experiencing frustration um, about um, missing important uh, appointments, medical appointments, um, as appointments letters are usually sent out um, and information sent out in paper form. Now, it's not only myself with visual impairment that can't read this, can't read these. And in fact, um, during COVID, it has exacerbated the situation um, because I had six weeks before I could get a, a load of correspondence read as I wasn't in contact with anybody. But for some of my other colleagues and friends and older people, 
they cannot hold paper sheets or, or find it difficult um, to hold paper sheets um, and so forth. So what can be done? Um, what can be done uh, that we can have accessible information to those who need it um, in this day and age of, of technology? Thanks, June. Um, in regards to how, how we actually change, how we identify uh, patients coming forward, we did see some changes in regards to the utilisation of technology, especially in regards to bringing patients forward at short notice during the pandemic when we were seeing no slots or appointments become available. But the further use of technology to communicate uh, with people with a disability or with a, a further need, um, that paper, I suppose, paper correspondence isn't accessible is something that, again, uh, I would ask the officials to follow up on and just in, in our interaction uh, with our with our engagement groups that we already have as well, but what work can be done across trusts. Um, you may be aware uh, you know, we're talking about introducing a new um, IT system across the entirety of health and social care and Compass. And it's about how it can be greater utilised, actually about how uh, people access their records or appointments as well. If there's something there that can be looked at even at, at this stage, because we want to make sure there is an ability to, that we're not losing slots within the health service uh, because we've sent out a, a letter that isn't accessible to the person that we want to actually come in and access our health service as well. So uh, I, I'm just tr trying to work through where we can actually best place that, but I'm sure Mark will be able to follow up with some of the officials uh, later on. I know that in Belfast Trust Decided Guide Service is one of the outcomes of the, the a pilot project that the Belfast uh, trust actually involved in every customer counts, um, and that was an initiative of the Equality Commission for for Northern Ireland. So I'm just I, I know that's operational, and and one of our trusts is how we just make sure it's rolled out across not just the rest of our trust, but also primary care provision as well. Thank you. I guess um, I guess I get very upset when I have to uh, ask my family or uh, someone to read a very personal uh, correspondence letter. Um, and I know that people are having um, appointments that arrive after the um, date uh, of the actual appointment, and I'm missing them as well. Thanks. So, uh, that. Okay, thank you, June. And Michaela? Good afternoon. Sorry, good morning. I'm way ahead of myself. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks, Minister, for taking the time to spend with us. Um, you know, just following on very briefly from what June said, I would appreciate if I could also reach out on the, the PPE requirements for personal assistance because that's not very clear at the moment and it's certainly a question I have had asked of me. Um, but you know, many people, um, this is what people rely on the services provided by our health service. And even when we are inpatients, we require the help of PAs, cars, or family members. But we are experiencing barriers to this. For example, we're experiencing people saying that we're not insured to use ward equipment. Um, so what, you know, this is in an environment where we're meant to feel safe and it's making us feel unsafe and putting us at risk. So what is the department going to do to resolve the issues to make sure that disabled people are experiencing the appropriate continuity of her and that they are actually safe in hospital. Um, thanks, Makaida. And, and I think that goes down to, to the crux of how we make sure our, our services are actually supporting the individual uh, in regards to what they need when they need it and how that service is actually delivered to them. That it's, it, it is person centred. And, you know, as I said to, to David earlier on, that is how we we make sure we're delivering for the people rather than actually looking after how the service itself works as well. In regards to challenges around about not being insured to use personal equipment, again, uh, Michaela, we'll, I'll get officials to follow up if there's individual cases that you have in, in regards to that, because I know it does cause certain difficulties, but it's usually or, can be solved or rectified either due to training or additional enhanced support for those service users coming in. And part of the problem is when we get staff turnover in regards to somebody coming in 
uh, to support a patient or an individual that maybe haven't received the appropriate training or because of staff shortages at short notice have been asked to fill a slot or, or cover a service that they haven't received that training for. But again, we'll get one of the, the officials either to follow up in this session or to follow up with you directly after it. Yeah, I would be more than happy to do that, Minister. It's, um, it's, it's an important issue. Um, I have another question, if that's okay, if you've got time. Um, Safely, please, Michaela. Thank you. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, none of our main hospitals in Northern Ireland have an outpatient teaching places hospital, uh, toilet. That includes the Royal, the Lee, um, there's none in the newly built down, and there's none, as far as I'm aware, in the Ulster Hospital. So, changing places will be mandatory um, in certain public buildings in Northern Ireland, with building regulations set to change in June. So, will the department commit to having changing places toilets in all outpatient departments in Northern Ireland? Uh Michaela, fully aware you know, of the announcement that uh, Minister Murphy made in regards to that uh, at the start of the week, but can also say fully aware of your part in the campaign as well, so uh, in regards to achieving that. I, I hope I have uh, enough a capital budget to build new hospitals uh, in the future as well, but it's also how we look to make sure that all our facilities are suitable uh, for everyone who needs to use them, so it is about how we progress any of those capital build rechanges. Uh, in regards to changing places and making sure those uh, facilities are accessible, but also being able to, to be utilised by everyone as well. So it's something that we're fully aware of through the campaign and that has been done up until now, but also due to the change in building regulations, that it is something that will be required uh, in any new build going forward as well. Thank you. And then uh, in terms of finally from the Disabled People's Parliament delegates, Joanne. Um. My first question is, many of the measures and supports introduced during COVID, such as testing, were not designed to be accessible to disabled people. Going forward, what will be implemented by the department to ensure that lessons are learned to address, foresee and correct such end user accessibility issues? Thanks, Joanne. And again, uh, a very important point. And I suppose when we, we looked at testing, especially at the start, was about mass testing and how we got it rolled out. Uh, and that is one of the learnings that we have to take as, as well on board. And that's the point that you make to make sure when we do look at those um, those facilities for testing, they're accessible to everyone and not just in regards to how the tests are carried out, but where they're carried out and by him as well. So it's actually rather than uh, self-testing was, was a very uh, effective measure that we brought in, but it's not accessible to everyone. So it's mm -hmm. how we actually t set up a supported service then as well. Should it be necessary going into the future uh, in regards to, to where we have, um, I suppose, COVID or other, other variants or outbreaks. I hope, Joanne, we're at a point uh, where it is about looking for lessons learned for a future, not something that we have to introduce uh, in the shorter medium term as well, because I do hope that we're we're fully progressing out of this 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 part of, of the pandemic as well. So your point in regards to to making sure not just as testing accessible, but also what we, the work that we have to do to make sure vaccination and those other support measures are accessible to everyone as well. So okay, thank you, Minister. And Joanne, do you have a second question, Joanne? Yes, the Office of National Statistics from Great Britain provided better data regarding the impact of COVID on disabled people. What steps are being taken to ensure the Northern Ireland Statistics and Research Agency replicate data sets in future to improve data collection and analysis? regarding disability and disabled pe people in all future research to enable comparative studies and statistics, furthermore, uh, ensuring that disabled people's disability no longer gets easily disregarded as a research limitation. 
Thank you, Joanne, uh, Minister. Thanks, Joanne. You're not leaving me to finish with the easy questions, are you? No. no. Look, uh, in, in regards to, uh, and I suppose, no, the, the point you make in regards to ONS, Northern Ireland feeds into the ONS statistics as well, but our own uh, statistical research here in the Northern Ireland, NISRA statistics that, that we produce as well. Um, and again, we're fortunate they actually sit under the, the Department of Finance. So when they take our health statistics and the, the, the figures they provide, they provide that, uh, I suppose, arm's length analysis of the data that we're able to provide. I think one of the things coming out of COVID that we've seen is actually the importance of health data and the utilization of that to make decisions as well. So that's why what we see coming out of NISRAS, coming out of ONS, has actually been uh, utilised to enable us to make decisions in certain ways as well. And when you look, you know, the quality uh, and the detail of the dashboards in regards to data that we've produced specifically in regards to COVID um, over the past two years, I think have been, you know, have been highly informative, not just for us as a health department, but also to be able to utilise uh, by the general public as well. Again, I mentioned earlier uh, Encompass, which is our new digital program that we hope to roll out across all health and social care. Now, it will take uh, a couple of years to achieve that, but one of the main aims behind that is to be able to look to the data that it'll be able to provide to allow us to drill down into regards to population needs, health needs, or the ability for early interventions as well. So it's really about how, you, how data captured uh, is utilised to improve health outcomes, not just for individuals, but also for society in general as well. But always one thing that, that, that I'm, I've been conscious of and very clear on in, in the past two years, when we talk about data driving decisions or driving interventions as well, it's crucial that we don't turn um, everything into data and numbers. What the health service is good at and what the health service must always be about is looking after an individual. For the individual should always be at the centre of everything we do. The individual should be always about it, but at the centre of every decision that we make as well. So while data is important to look to those bigger, um, I suppose, society drives or society changes, it's always important that we ensure we have a service that delivers for the individual and for the person. Yes, I hundred percent agree. But it just in future, if there is a data set that informs policy in a disability way, why is it not being implemented in Northern Ireland in the same same way? And I think it is, George. One, we we don't have the systems in place to collect the, the data that we need to be able to make those informed situations at present. But one of the things that Encompass will actually will do will allow us to look at that proactively uh, so we can make those changes as well. You know, uh, England introduced NHSX a number of years ago, so they, they are ahead of us in that. Uh, but it's work that is ongoing here, and I think it's work that will be valuable for us. Yes, because quality of data also tells personal lived experience stories through research. So research can, can tell person-centered stories as well as statistics. Very much so. Absolutely correct, Joanne. And actually, I think it's really a fundamental issue. And, and it's, it's a, in terms of the minister's contribution, I think it's, it's, a, it's a, a great place to end. I do think COVID has kind of demonstrated the fact that we need better research, better data here, based locally um, and, and just not extrapolated. So, and just to inform everyone in the meeting that we actually are taking a briefing from Encompass in our next session. Yeah. And also, in, refer, in reference to the issue raised about GPs, we're hearing from GPs next week. So, both of the issues you have raised are on the committee's radar as well. I just want to go back to you, Minister, to check. Thank you for taking those questions and for giving your presentation. And just to check, do you want to make any final closing remarks there before we go over to the other, other members? No, Chair. Again, just to, to thank you for facilitating this, this session this morning and to thank the people for the, from uh, the Parliament for attending as well and 
and, and their questions as well. I'll not make any comments about the quality of their questions compared to the quality of the, the health committee's members' questions <laughs> at this point, Chair, but I find their, the members of the Parliament's engagement uh, very, very useful and very instructive. The only thing that concerns me now, Chair, is with that round of question, I have a raft of officials on here who have uh, probably nothing left to answer, but I hope between yourselves and the Parliament, but also uh, the members of the committee, that, they, that you still have enough questions left for them to make it worth their while being here. Yeah, well, and, and certainly I think there will, be, there will be other questions, but thank you, Minister, and uh, I wish you all the best in the time ahead as well. And we'll certainly take on board the fact that you want the questions to be, uh, to be, to be coming at you more hard and fast, and we, we, we look forward to seeing you at our next session. So thank you, Minister. And uh, so I'm going to go now and I'll take a few, uh, I'll take a round of questions from, from uh, committee members, and then what I want to do is come back and leave some space at the end to come back to members of the Disabled People's Parliament to pick up on issues and to follow, uh, follow up on anything that you feel needs a, a further follow-up. Can I remind particularly the members of our panel who are now coming in to ask, answer questions, could you please identify your name so that uh, people who are watching in, and, and I believe there are many people out there, I'm delighted to, that there are many people out there watching in online, as well as the people in the room, so any, for anyone with visual impairment, that you identify who is speaking so that, to assist those uh, people in, in examining the evidence. The other thing is that I want to say to the panel is if you're picking up on an issue that was raised that the Minister indicated, please indicate that and, uh, and if you're picking that up as part of another, as another member's questions. But for now I'm going to go to uh, Paula and then I have, uh, no sorry, I'm going to go to Colin first, then Paula, then Carol. Go ahead Colin. Thank you very much for that, Chair. Uh, Colin McGrath here, one of the committee members for the Health Committee, and um, it's been a great session to watch this because uh, quite often we represent people's views, but whenever people can actually give their real living examples of what they are living with day and daily and the problems that they face, there is just so much more currency uh, to that, and, and I know that certainly the Minister has highlighted that, so I hope that the officials will uh, also likewise uh, take away what you have heard today and, and work on responses. But. Um, there's just two issues that I wanted to ask, and I'll ask them in one go. Um, one is in relation to the fact that we do have a cost of living crisis that everybody in our community is feeling, but those that have disabilities often have to have additional aids and adaptations and machinery, um, which costs extra money. Some people living with disabilities will require additional heating, etc. And I was just wondering what the department was doing to try and identify that and work with other colleagues to try and address that. Um, and also in terms of those that are uh, employers um, as uh, people directly employing people to assist them as personal assistants, there, there is a complete lack of support from the department in terms of being at the end of the phone if there are issues that need to be um, assisted with. And I was just wondering what the officials' views would be on that. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. So, um, Mark, could, could, your, uh, could you identify who's going to pick up the question or, or a member of the panel identify who's picking it up and who they are, please? Thank you. Mark, you're on mute, we believe. Still not hearing from you, Mark. So maybe if another member of the panel could indicate to come in on that question. No, we're still not hearing you, Mark. So do we have another member of the department panel who can pick up on Colin's question in relation to cost of living and in relation to PAs? Uh, Chair, Gerard Cassidy here. I'm the director of primary care. Um, uh, I, I'm, I, I, it's not really my, an area that I'm um, expert in and I'm, I'm not really best placed to answer the question, but I mean, I'm, I'm very happy to take it back offline and, and come back with a proper response. In the interest of keeping the meeting going, I mean, I, I know we're, when we're having some connection difficulties, you couldn't hear me speaking earlier, unfortunately. So um, I, unless Mark can, can, can be heard now, I'm happy to take that question offline and come back to the committee in writing, if that's okay. Okay, well, I'll just check. Do we, no, we still don't have your, your sound, Mark, so that, that could be an issue. So what I'll do, Colin, is I'll move on, I'll move on to uh, the next questioner, and we'll come back to that, and we'll either get that information back for you in writing, or we will, uh, if, if, Mark, if we get Mark online, maybe he can pick up on it. But I'm going to go now to Paula. 
Um, thank you, Chair. My name is Paula Bradshaw Lyons, Party Representative on the Health Committee. Um, it, it, I'm very concerned about the rate of, of the reform and transformation agenda within the Department of Health, and I know um, it, it's a massive issue, um, especially during the COVID process, uh, COVID pandemic. And I'm just wondering, um, you know, what big ticket, what big reform packages are is the department thinking of to look at the services that are in place to support those people living with disabilities? Yeah, so can the member of the panel indicate picking up on that on transformation? Again, um, uh, thanks, Chair Gerard Cassidy, Director of Primary Care. I, I mean, I'm probably, I can answer from the primary care point of view. Um, I mean, um, and as you've alluded to, I'll be back next week to talk about um, primary care access as well. So, I mean, if, if, if I don't cover it in full now, um, you can get a second bite next week. Um, yeah, well, tr uh, prior to my working in in, in, um, in primary care, I actually worked in transmission um, program as, as well. So I, I do have a kind of a degree of familiarity with it. Um, in primary care, I mean, our, 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 our single biggest um, I guess project or priority would be the multidisciplinary, multidisciplinary team um, program. Um, that's um, it's 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 the flagship um, primary care intervention. Um, we've been rolling it out um, in earnest since 2018. Um, and the the in terms of specifically for disability for for, for disabled people, um, the aim of the program is really to boost access for everyone, and, and that will include and benefit the disabled community as well. Um, the you know been able to provide more services closer to home, um, avoiding need for onward referral into secondary care services, which are as everyone understands very stretched. I mean that, that those are kind of key aims for us. Um, program has been uh, it's been it's 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 been it's been on, on the ground since 2018. We're currently it's it's we're taking a kind of a federation by federation approach to the program. Um, there's 17 GP federations in Northern Ireland. We currently have a presence in seven of those 17 to a greater or lesser extent. Um, uh, I would say it's fair to say that, you know, the COVID pandemic has had a, a significant impact on our ability to roll out. I mean, we, we effectively had to, through, through redirection of resources in health service and also kind of in, within the department and, and in the board as well, just kind of the kind of priorities focusing on, um, on addressing those issues. Um, we we have had a um, as progress has been slower than we would ideally have liked. Um, that said, you know we we have a good level of coverage and and a good level of service across um, those areas where we have it. The priority is to come up with um, plans for how to roll it out uh, more widely. Um, we you know, we've been um, working on on a roadmap for that. So the first kind of product of that is uh, an outline running order for you know where we will go next. Um, that's you know, been agreed. Um, and the, the next challenge is to really um, get the um, get a, a kind of detailed plans in place for how it will, how it will be rolled out in those remaining areas. And at the time scale for that, um, cognizant of the fact that um, we are in a very uncertain budgetary position and there also are significant workforce pressures, which will you know, determine how we do that. Key to our approach in doing that is working in partnership. That's working in partnership on a local level with federations and trusts, and also with our kind of with our professional colleagues to to see what scope we have for creativity and for innovation in our approach, and also what would be to maximise what is deliverable in those areas in within the kind of uh, financial envelope and within the kind of the constraints of resource. I don't know. Is that I mean that that's probably quite a, a, a narrow answer to your question, Paula? Um, but um, uh, if you've any, I can take any further questions on that at all. Or? Um, no, thank you. I, I suppose in some ways I don't think it was specific enough to those people living with disability. Uh, and certainly towards the end of your response there, it looked like you were consulting, you know, sort of within uh, within the federations or within the department. And I'm just wondering in what way you would be engaging um, going forward in terms of a, a specific um, package of transformation measures that would actually meet the needs. Certainly some of them have been outlined today and I'm sure there are a long list as well. You know, what is going to be do, done specifically in terms of co-production with those people living with disabilities? I'm not sure you can answer that today, but it is something that well, I, 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 I mean, I can, I, can, I can answer as far as I can answer, Paul, and, and that's picking up on one of the, um, the disabled people's part of um, Amanda, who has a similar point as well, so was something that was kind of keen to come back on. 
Um, yeah, co-production, I mean, as you'll be aware, uh, goes through the heart of the, um, the, kind of the, the overall transformation agenda. Um, we primarily, I suppose, we look to work through the patient client council as a, as a kind of conduit to, um, to uh, engaging with uh, particular stakeholder and patient groups. Um, but I'd, I'd be very open to, um, to working with the parliament as well. I mean, you know, to kind of to, to provide briefings and, and, and take, um, take their views and, and work with them on how we can better uh, reach disabled people and reflect their needs and their, um, their, their, their interests and concerns in as we can make plans for, for development. Yep, thank you, Gerard. Thank, thank you, Paula. You. I'm going then to um, Carol. Yep, um, right, thank you, Gormaga Carly. Um, Carl Nikellen, Sinn Féin MLA for North Belfast. I'm also sitting on the Health Committee. Um, so thank you um, for um, being here with us today as part of our questioning to the Minister and the officials. I'm not sure if Mark is back on, and I appreciate that everything that's been said up until now is probably the right thing to say, but in the middle of it all, we have a crisis in workforce. And unless that crisis is addressed, um, that the questions that were asked, every single one of them are completely valid, then how can we have better access to respite? How can we have better access to multidisciplinary teams? How can we ensure that GPs are more open and accessible? So that would be the main thrust of my question, Chair. Yep. So on workforce issue, can I ask someone on the panel? I don't see Mark online there, so I'll ask someone else on the panel to pick up on the issue of workforce and its impact on developing and delivering services. Chair, if I can just come in briefly. Um, this is Ryan Wilson. I'm Director of Secondary Care in the Department of Health. Mark is unfortunately having some technical problems, but he has, he has joined me in my room here. so. He will have missed most of Carl's question, but if you wouldn't mind, I think if I can just sort of summarise it, the question is around um, uh, workforce issues and how they might be addressed. Carl, I'm sorry um, if I haven't captured that fully, but I'll, would I'll you mind summarising it just for Mark I'll, as he's I'll now? Ask Carl, Brian, I'll ask Carl to repeat the question. <laughs> Carl, go ahead and repeat the question, please, just for clarity. Mark, it's good to see you. Um, we've all had technical problems, so what we usually do in here is what you've just done. We scoot into each other's rooms to make sure we don't miss anything. So to make sure you've heard all the questions, I'm going to repeat it again. Most of the questions that everyone has asked up until now, um, at the heart of it all, in my opinion, is a, a crisis in workforce. So for example, around co-production, around access to GPs, around domiciliary care packages and access to respite care, in the middle of it all, there is a crisis in workforce and workforce planning. So what can be done to ensure that that is dressed as a matter of urgency? And if, if you don't mind, if um, you could speak up a wee bit, because I'm having difficulty just hearing, and maybe it's just technology, but I'm having difficulty hearing. So, please. Thank you. Thank you, Carol. Mark McGuigan, Director of Disability and Older People. And apologies, Chair, I've had a nightmare with technology this morning, so yeah. uh, same way I'm with Ryan. Um, in terms of, of workforce, my primary would be in, in relation to domiciliary care and, and care homes workforce and what we do in terms of trying to, to bolster the independent sector. Um, as Minister noted earlier, we did put significant additional resource into the sector um, uh, in November. That that's primarily stabilised the sector and has attracted um, new people in into a number of the, 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 the major firms. We are also uh, delivering what we call a Fair Work Forum, which is a, a, a co-produced piece between ourselves, um, the, the, the department, uh, a number of the regulatory bodies, um, the, the unions, and a number of the, the domiciliary care and care home providers. This is in terms of trying to, to set a fair standard across the board. Um, we will be appointing an independent chair to take this work forward, and this work will dovetail with the, the consultation on the reform of adult social care. So we are trying to do a number of things, Carol, to, to in, ensure that the workforce is there. In terms of respite services, the Minister did mention uh, around the, the, the PHA pathway, which he has now approved. We're working with trusts, um, and we have written out the trust to ensure that they do, they do um, reopen respite and daycare services as quickly and as safely as is possible. We have responses in from, from all trusts now in, in terms of the rebuild plans, and we're analysing those and challenging the timescales 
and challenging the work that needs done to, to reopen the respite um, services and daycare opportunities. But you're right, staffing is a huge issue. Um, the, the ongoing long COVID uh, and the impact of Omicron has had on services has meant that, that some services in the community have had to be um, stood down or reduced to, to tackle some of the, 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 the pressures in the, the acute services. So it's a situation which we're trying to tackle. In terms of, of um, other workforce um, call or issues, I will pass on maybe to Ryan or Garou to, to deal with those. Thanks, Mark. There's just one one point I think worth adding to that. Um, members of the, of the committee at least will be aware of the department having a um, published a workforce strategy a number of years ago. Um, and I think Carol quite rightly points out that most of the pressures um, do boil down to a workforce or a need to, to train and recruit more people um, and, and right across specialties and, and across primary community and, and hospital services. So I think the point needs to be made that that a lot um, of that depends on, on investment and, and had been factored into our our plans for, for a three year budget. So, um, you know, we, we really need um, some progress on, on, on the future investment and on the future budget in order to, to be able to begin to, to really meet the, the root cause of some of those those workforce shortages, in addition to the, the issues that, that Mark has, has mentioned around around um, sickness and turnover. Yeah, and Gerard, were you going to come in there briefly if you can? Yeah, yeah, Chair, thank you. Um, just to add, and kind of a minister has alluded to this already. I mean, we're, we're keenly aware of the um, workforce challenges in primary care in particular around the number of GPs. Um, We've done a lot in recent years to increase the number of GPs. I think Minister referenced there's been a 70% increase in the number of trainees um, over 2015 levels. So that's, that brings up to 111 trainees on an annual basis. Um, we're just um, embarking or have, have recently embarked on some work um, to review the number of GP training places as required to make sure that we do have the right numbers going forward. I mean, that work is not yet complete, but, you know, we, you know, that will give us a very strong sense of what we need and as, as ryan's indicated you know what, what we can deliver on that will be subject to the, the budget and kind of wider funding position okay. yes chair can i just have a small follow-up yeah. question um look i i appreciate we're all in a situation that's not of our making we don't have an executive because the dup walked off the stage we can't go beyond budgets because we we'll need to live from budgets from week to week. So we know all that, but the issue is, and no one's answered it, and, I, and I'm not being awkward, but the talk about the importance of MDTs has been talked about and won't be addressed until we tackle the workforce issues. And if the MDTs aren't addressed and all the services that are needed won't be addressed either, it'll be piecemeal and it'll be by postcode. So I just want to put that. The last question I have, Chair, is this. Has the £500 payment for um, recognition been paid to everyone in the independent sector. If we could get that confirmed, because that is still something each of us are getting raised in our constituencies. Shane, or Melgut, Carol. Carol, Carol. Um, August Arish, uh, good evening, panel. Um, could someone pick up on that question around the £500 payment on independent sector, please? Yes, Chair Mark McGugan again here. Um, I can confirm that the £500 payment is, is being actively um, ruled out as we speak. There's been a number of elements to this uh, and that, that we are currently working on now for people who have left employers during the qualifying period. So we've written out to employers to ask them to make contact with previous employees um, to, to ensure that we can pay that to those employers or those employees. We're ruling that out at the minute. The next stage of this then will be launched on the 21st of March, which will be in, in terms of payments to personal assistance, um, independent living fund and survivors of thalidomide fund. So that, that will be launched. We're, we're using a, a portal through the um, college in, in ILF Scotland to manage those payments directly. So it is rolling through. We, we, we are, we've, we've progressed this significantly. We have had a few hurdles along the way, if, I, if I'm honest with you, um, Carol, but we, we're working very, very hard to make sure this is rolled forward. We've been able to, to move the money into next year to allow us to continue on with that. So we're working through all of the cohorts, but we are trying to make sure that everybody is covered in this payment that, that is eligible for it. So that work continues, and we are still um, putting significant resource into getting that through as quickly as we possibly can. But it is rolling forward. Thank you, Mark. And I think David wants to come in briefly on this one. Yep. Um, David McDonald, Disabled People's Parliament. 
Mark, I just want to, you were talking about domiciliary care providers there. Um, I'm wondering what the situation is with PAs, um, particularly on the direct payments. We have not seen any money increased. So for three months, as direct payment users, we've been sitting on the same amount of money we had before Christmas, which in itself came along late. Um, so how on earth do we compete? How do we stop our workers leaving and going to try and get more money from providers and therefore creating another crisis amongst disabled people who are, quite frankly, freely and without any charge trying to look after ourselves? Yep. Yeah, so follow up there, Mark, in relation to the PAs. Yes, that, Chair. In terms of PAs, we are working with trust to, to gather the data on how much we pay out in terms of PAs and how much that would cost them to give an uplift. The PAs, as David is aware, we, we uplifted the, 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 the domiciliary care um, already rate to eighteen pounds an hour to those providers who are, who are delivering domiciliary care. My understanding is that the rate for personal assistance at the minute is in around thirteen fifty um, mark per hour. And that was paid directly to the individuals. We, we are, as I said, we're working on trust to get the data. Um, there's a significant amount of money paid out by trusts in, in terms of personal assistance. And, and uh, you, this will sound like a broken record, but as we go into next year, the financial position is very, very difficult. We will put in place the minister as soon as we possibly can in terms of what it will cost both this year and going forward next year and seeing what is deliverable about that. But that is something which we're actively considering. And I, I totally take on board David's comments that it is very difficult and we are getting um, a, a lot of correspondence on the fact that people who are employed, uh, employed through um, direct payments are starting to leave to take up employment yeah. at a higher rate with domiciliary care firms. And we are really alive to that. And, and I can only apologise that we haven't been able to pro progress this yeah, uh, quicker than we have at the minute. But it is something which we're actively considering and we'll be putting advice to the Minister as soon as we have a appropriate figure work in place to do that. Did you say 1350? I think I thir I have a figure, £13.58, um, David, in, correct in, me if I'm wrong. In the reform of adult social care, the differential is between £18 for private providers and £15 for direct payment users. Why are we keeping it so low? When the providers are getting, are getting it, sorry, I, I had a figure in my head of thirteen point fifty eight. I've ran in another office and I haven't lifted my my folder. If I'm honest with you, so um, I I will come back to you on that, David, if that's okay. I'm simply saying it should be equitable. So if you, if you're paying private providers an extra what three pound um, is what it would be from fifteen pound up to eighteen odds, um, direct payment users should get getting the three pound too. Well, I, I think we do have to look, we do have to look at what overheads, etc., major providers would have in, in delivering that service across the board, and compared well, to what um, somebody well, employed in a direct payment would I, have. I, so, I, what we you would suggest we should have an equitable rate of eighteen pounds an hour. We have to see if that is affordable, and the, the, the um, what we can do to make sure that that we do not um, allow, allow people to leave um, direct from, direct award contracts or direct payment facilities. To go into domiciliary care, so we are looking at it, David, and we are actively some, looking at it. Some providers are currently offering um, the most I've seen is fifteen pound an hour. Um, generally, I'm seeing twelve pound sixty. Um, how can I possibly do that on thirteen fifty when you take into account my contributions to national insurance, which is thirteen point eight percent, and will go up one point two five percent come April? Um, also, have to pay towards a pension. There's no way on 1350 I can match what the domiciliary care providers are, are making. And, and they're doing it for a profit. I'm doing all the work for nothing. It, I, don't, I don't charge for the work I do to provide management of the care. And I think we need to reconsider um, the 1350 and, and look at maybe what was recommended in the, adults, um, the reform of adult social care, which is £15. Um, the, the, Care providers were offered eighteen pound, and they're getting eighteen pound. Thank you, David. David, I have Michaela looking to come in on this issue as well, yeah. so I will bring Michaela in. The last members, where we indulge, just would go to Michaela because I think it's an important issue. Michaela, go ahead, please. Yeah, sorry for that. Thanks very much, Chair. I appreciate it. I just want to ask the department uh, when the last time that they actually assess what the overheads are for individuals who uh, employ personal assistance, the cost that that would would be um, because as David says we are doing this for free and if they haven't done it fully commit to doing it now. 
Mark, please. I, I can certainly commit that we will we'll consider that, Mikhail, as part of the, the outworkings of the Reform of Adult Social Care Consultation. Um, the, the consultation will come to me to implement after the, the, the consultation responses have been analysed. So I'm will happy to give that commitment that we will consider that as part of the, the, the wider Reform of Adult Social Care work going forward. And, okay, and, and I will move on, but just, just to indicate that we have raised in committee previously our disappointment at times with the lack of bids that have been put in by the department for additional pressures, mm -hmm. and I think that's relevant to that discussion. So, Mark, there is some important information you've, you've, uh, you've committed to providing back to the members of this meeting, and if we could ask that to be done urgently, just in the circumstances that we're in time-wise. Thank you. So I'm going to move on then. I'm going to go back to Colin, who, who uh, lost his opportunity to, to ask Marcus question due to the technical difficulties. So Colin, I'll go back to you, please, um, as brief as you can. Thanks very much indeed. Um, I suppose maybe uh, the members of the uh, Disability Parliament that have joined us today will understand sometimes our frustration, Chair, um, because, Mark, that was a great civil service answer that you would commit to consider something as opposed to actually doing it. And, and that sometimes is a frustration that we have. And we've got to keep that check and keep that pressure. And that's the importance uh, of having the likes of a health committee to keep those checks in place. But the questions I had, Mark, I'm sure you remember them. They were about the um, cost of living crisis that people are facing at the minute and how that would be uh, more severely uh, felt by those from the disability community because of the additional costs that they have and if the department has done anything with on an interdepartmental basis to see if there's ways to resolve that and then just following on from that conversation there about um, personal assistance where people are actually the employers but they don't have any of that access to support in terms of employment rights and insurances and other bits and pieces and is there something that could be done on that front as well Thank you. Yep. Thanks, yeah. Colin. In terms of the, the cost of living crisis, I would suggest that's more an executive matter rather than directly a Department of Health matter, because obviously um, other departments are providing additional grants for heating and, and additional grants which are already being ruled out. So I'm not sure that the department would have uh, would have the funding or, or the virus to actually deliver that directly. In terms of personal assistance, I, I do take on board. There's been a number of questions raised today in terms of personal assistance, in terms of insurance, and in terms of, of the actual cost of delivering that service. So I, I am committed, and, and you're right, I am, I, am I, I take pride in being a good civil servant, so but I will give a commitment that we will, we will look at those issues directly, and we will come back to the committee as quickly as possible. Okay, Colin? Yeah, Chair, that's grand. We, I think we've lost the word consider there, so that's good. I appreciate that. Thank you very much, Mark. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Colin. And going then to our Deputy Chair, Pam Cameron. Go ahead, Pam Lanaray, Little Hall. Thank you, Chair, and um, thank you um, to the panel for being here today. And I want to say a particular thanks to our delegates from the Disabled People's Parliament. I think it's been a really um, powerful session this morning, and I think um, your questions are just. Um, fantastic and so relevant and it's and i think it's great opportunity for you to challenge the minister and the department directly on the issues that affect you most we understand that there are almost one in five people in northern ireland are living with a disability um so it is essential that um disabled people and their advocates have a forum to to make their voices heard and we need to ensure that those living with disability are to the forefront of shaping new legislation and policy and, uh, and and disabled people must also have a substantive role in health recovery. Um, I am concerned, I suppose, uh, about um, how we collect or don't collect data and about how we consult or don't consult with um, interested parties and how we plan and, and ultimately how um, provision is rolled out. Um, and I know the question was asked and around um, consultation I think the answer was it's it's done through the patient client council maybe you could confirm that's right and that suggestion that, that that there is an openness to possibly consult going forward with the disabled people's parliament I think that would be entirely appropriate and there may be other, be other groups as well that could be included in that so if you could just talk a bit more around that and whether obviously we will be getting the um, much awaited uh, briefing on encompass um, soon today um, and what role will Encompass have in uh, improving that data collection and, and, and gathering those data sets in order to plan uh, going forward in terms of workforce issues? 
Yep, so we'll go back to yourself, Mark, maybe initially, or do you want to indicate another one of your officials? No, I'm, I'm happy to take that, Chair. As the Minister noted in, in his, his opening comments, we have established a Regional Disabled People's Forum for Health and Social Care, and, and we, do, um, we do engage directly with, with the sector. Um, Deputy Chair will also be aware of the Autism Forum, where we have a, a co-produced um, aut or a, a, an autism forum where we have people with lived experience of autism on that forum in helping us deliver and, uh, and shape policy. David also sits on um, the, the ILF working group where we have developed proposals for, for ILF going forward. So, and, and indeed, each, each consultation will have its own set of specific stakeholders that we will engage with. So it's not a one size fits all, Pam, but we, we do engage um, extensively. With, with the disabled sector and other sectors as well. And, and the work today that, that the committee have done, I have to commend as, as a director of disability and all the people in the department, I do commend the work that the, the committee has done today. And it's an example that we will take forward and we will try to engage more fully with the disabled people's parliament as we as we develop policies going forward. And that is a commitment, it's not a consideration, that is something which we will engage more, um, more fully with the disabled people's parliament um, as, as we move things forward in the reform of adult social care. Um. Yes, thank you for that. Um, and I wanted to also ask around um, access to GPs. And uh, as other members have already mentioned, the uh, the role of MDTs, uh, and in particular the the concern there is ar around the rural areas of the Northern Ireland. Uh, and I should have uh, chair earlier uh, passed on Deborah's apologies for submitting. She's um, she has COVID and wasn't, has been sick and not able to attend today. But I know she would have been very keen to ask around those uh, MDTs and she's very concerned, obviously, about um, the GP provision in the west of the province and, you know, that sustainability going forward into the future. So what, what more work is being done to ensure that, that we will have the GPs there that we need? And we know we've heard before from GPs and we've heard now about how New GPs are working um, differently from, from the older generations of GPs and that we really need to be real about this and understand that we need much more in terms of, of quantity uh, and numbers of GPs because part-time hours often equate to full-time hours in terms of GP services and um, we also know that obviously females within those roles throughout all of the health service actually um, often have caring responsibilities throughout their lives whether that's for their own children um, or um, caring for older members of the family later on in life. But there, there are circumstances in life which mean that, that people can not always work full time with their profession throughout their lifetime. And I think there has to be um, a realisation of that. So what plans and preparations are being put in place to ensure that we have the numbers, not just in GPs, but of all the different health professionals, that the numbers actually stack up uh, to meet the needs of, of uh, the future. Yeah, and just before, before a member of the panel, could I remind the panel just to state who you are so for, for those who are watching in on the meeting or attending the meeting who are of visual impairment, and also just to remind members that we are a, seeing a simultaneous British Sign Language interpretation, and we will be arranging for Irish Sign Language interpretation to be made available for those who wish to follow the meeting uh, to, to pick up on the meeting later. So I'll go back to the panel then in relation to the GP question. Is it yourself, Giroud, and will, and will she and Tussa? No, Mark. Uh, thank you, Chair. No, I'll take this one. I'm Giroud Cassidy, Director of Primary Care in the Department. Um, and thank you, Pam, for the question. I, I, it was something I was keen to come back on. Um, Amanda had asked questions in a similar point from the um, Disabled People's um, Parliament. Um, there's quite a lot in, in the question. I mean, in terms of the... Um, GP practices and accessibility. I mean, I think, I mean, there, there is, um, the, 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 the kind of, certainly Amanda's initial point was around GPs not offering appointments. I mean, I think it's probably more accurate to say that there has been a change in how appointments have been offered. Um, you know, you, you, the committee will have been briefed before, and I'm sure I, I, I said I'll be here next week as well. We can go into some more detail then, but um, there has been a move towards uh, a telephone first model for consultation. Um, um, that's that, and that that really is is a, a means of managing increasing demand for services. I mean, it predates COVID. I mean, COVID has accelerated the trend towards doing that. But the you know strategically and and you know um, 
aspirationally that this this this, 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 this has been the kind of intended direction um, for a while now. Um, it's uh, it, it has had the through the pandemic it has had the benefit of it's been able to um, make, make sure that services were able to remain open um, and accessible to people um, in a time when you know there was a limitation on the, the physical number of people who could, could who could come into practice due to IPC measures. Um, the challenge is obviously for us to make sure that, that system works as well as it can work. I mean, I would say we've put in a considerable investment over the past two years, um, 1.7 million on, in, in each of the last two years, specifically on improving the telephony systems, but also then improving the use of those systems to make sure that, you know, it's not just the telephone there, but there's someone there to answer the phone and to, to take action, be it, you know, um, for an, a repeat prescription or for an appointment. I think the first thing the GPs would say as well is that they do still offer face-to-face -face appointments where it's appropriate. Um, it's you know there is it's just that there is a level of um, uh, the consultation starts via the telephone. Um, for for the majority of people, um, it means that you Rod, effectively. Rod, uh, sorry, sorry I'll, to I'll hear me. To you will have to interrupt you there and ask you to be as brief as possible. We are under oh, pressure okay. of time. Well, and no, no, specific. well no, so I mean, we, we, I can come back and talk in more detail about, about the access issue. In terms of the workforce issue, I've already mentioned, we're doing a lot of work to understand what we need um, for GPs. I mean, and, and that is driven, part of that is understanding what's driving. Um, we've increased the numbers of GPs in, in, in training, but at the same time, the number of FTEs being worked has decreased in the same period. That's due to... Um, uh, kind of uh, different lifestyle expectations and you know the realities of people's lives, as Pam has indicated. That work is being factored into our review of the requirements for training places. And finally, in terms of rurality and MBT, I mean, I'm very aware that rural practice in particular are under pressure. We, I, I, I met with uh, Fermanagh and Oma Council a month ago, and I'm due back in a couple of weeks' time with 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 colleagues from the board to really talk to understand their issues and to help them understand what we're doing to, to help with that. MBT is a very important part of that, and as I've indicated, we um, we we are putting together doing detailed work on how we can move forward in what in what is a very difficult financial and also personnel um, time, but. Um, I'm, it's, I'll, I'll leave it at that for now, and I can come back on any more details next week. Okay, if you could, if you could provide the committee with, with detailed information of the planning that's going on. Also, can you give us a date, um, Gerard, for when the, the roadmap will be published for MDT roadmap? What's yeah, the date? Well, the, 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 the robot, we've been finalising a version. The roadmap's been through several kind of. Um, uh, it's been a long gestation. Sorry, Gerard, um, Gerard, I don't. I, 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 I do want to apologise. I just don't have time to go into. I'm just looking to know a date okay. if I can. Just well, I'd say in the next couple of weeks. Okay, thank you, thank you. That that that's that's useful. Um, I'm going to go then to our. I think just one of the members were looking to ask a, a question. Well, I'm, sure. I'm going to be coming back okay. to the members. Okay. We'll go to you early, and I'll, I'll be coming back to the members. And I do want to. We are under pressure time, but I will come back to the members and ask Dave to do you for another brief question or final comment or whatever. But I'll take our latest question and then come back to the Parliament delegates. That's great. Thanks very much. Um, and just first of all, a very warm welcome to all the members of the Disabled People's Parliament. I know virtually and and the guests that are in the room with us. Um, I think the minister was right. Your lines of questioning you have definitely showed up the committee members today. So well done for that. Uh, and maybe just to follow on from one of the other questions that was raised by one of the members um, directly to the Minister, it might be for Mark. Um, it was just in terms of the Independent Living Fund and I know the Minister couldn't commit um, to uh, he couldn't commit to funding that before the end of this mandate. But does any of the officials on the line have um, a detailed update as to where that is actually sitting within the department. I know the lobby that we receive says that the proposals might be with the permanent secretary. Um, and is there any chance or likelihood of even getting that proposal out for consultation before the end of the mandate? Um, that's my question. And then just secondly, to make the point that I do want to welcome the investment that's recently came from the Department of Health from the Mental Health Support Fund. There was a pot of money that has went into disability action um, to help provide mental health supports for disabled people. And sometimes I think that's one of the big issues that can be sort of overseen and forgotten about. So I want to welcome that investment. Um, and hopefully you might have a bit of a positive update in terms of the Independent Living Fund. Thank you. Thank you. Go ahead, Mark, please. Mark McGugan, Director of Disability and Older People. Um, yes, I can update that the, the, the submission in terms of, of next steps the independent living fund is currently with the Permanent Secretary. There's been a number of iterations on that, and as the accounting officer, the Permanent Secretary has come back and challenged a number of, of the 
the, the consultation or sorry the, the proposals within the submission to him. At this stage, it would be very difficult for either the permanent secretary or the minister to to commit to doing anything next year in the absence of a three-year budget. And, and I know you keep hearing that, but that is the reality to it. The proposals that came forward from the, the ILF working group were um, to reopen the fund, which would have cost either seven or, or 14 million, depending on what option was was agreed on. At this minute in time, the, the department quite simply doesn't have that additional money to, to commit to, to new resource going forward next year or in, in, in following years. But I said that that submission is with the permanent secretary at the minute. It went back to him this morning, actually. Um, it, it says it's been backwards and forwards with the permanent secretary because he has challenged some of the 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 the, the, the workings in, in the submission and the proposals within the submission. So we hope to get that submission to the minister. But I cannot give a commitment to go out to consultation on reopening the fund uh, at this stage because we simply do not have the funding available to do that. But that will be a, a decision for the minister to take on advice from the permanent secretary. Okay, Mark, and thank you for that response. And just to say, I do think it would be helpful um, whenever those conversations have concluded with the Permanent Secretary and the Minister, if it is in fact um, a case of this can't be taken forward because of the lack of the three-year budget and the lack of a uh, First Minister. I think that needs to be provided in writing to the Disabled People's Parliament because it's too important an issue. Yep. Thank you, Aaliyah. Yep. Go ahead, Mark. I'm just saying I'm happy to commit that, Chair. We will, we will get the Minister to write um, once the decision has been taken. Okay. Okay. And I'm conscious uh, we are, all, as always, under pressure of time, but there, there may be questions that haven't been asked. But if members of the meeting want to forward questions, we'll, we'll forward those on to the Department and, and seek a response to those. Um, so what I want to do then is, and, and I know of an indication there from both Amanda and David, but what I want to do is take another br brief question, and it will literally only be a minute or two now that we have each. Um, if I could take a brief question or a comment from each of you, and what I'll do is I'll go in reverse order from, from what we did originally. So I'll go to Joanne, Michaela, June, Amanda and David. So back to Joanne then on screen. Joanne, do you have any comments or anything you want to, to uh, follow up on very briefly there, please? I thank the committee for the time today, and also to ask the insurance department plans to ensure that disabled people are meaningfully are involved in shaping these decisions of health and social care in the future, particularly in, in relation to the trust. Absolutely, absolutely. And I think that is the overarching lesson of, of the day. And, and, and why wouldn't they as well? In, in, in a routine, a regular, and a just a, you know, that, that is essential. Uh, it, it's in everyone's interest. I have to I say this often. It's in the department's interest as well to take that expertise on board rather than, uh, rather than you know, it's direct, it's very valid, and it's, it's very uh, accurate. So thank you, Joanne. Michaela. Thank you. I just want to uh, thank everyone involved in today, making today happen, and also for being so open to answering our questions. Mm -hmm. I do have one final one. Um, I pressed the Minister earlier on committing to having change in places when it's available in all equity departments. But in terms of being an inpatient, very few hospital beds have overhead costs. If you need to be able to be registered on a SBT scanner, that can be also very difficult. And there are other physical access problems. Process an inpatient and an outpatient. Um, so I, I would like to ask the department to commit to investigate what the issues actually are and to addressing them. Yep, Mark, do you want to pick up on that one? I think, Chair, that would be a matter for, for us to take forward with trust. The, the, I would suggest that what is available within a hospital is a matter for the, the, the trust to deliver as opposed to the department. So, but I, I'm more than happy if, the, if the, the, com the committee want to write to us, we will take that forward with the relevant trusts. Yep. Okay, thank you. And going then to June. Go ahead, June, please. Thank you for your time, everyone. And I just want to say that I want to go back to communication because communication is key right across the whole of the health uh, service, every, everyone and the trusts. Um, and I'm just wondering, um, I know Minister answered my question uh, um, well, but I just wonder how long we've got to wait um, for appropriate information to make sure that all patients 
have appropriate and accessible information? And also, what are the departments and trusts doing to communicate with um, people whose first language is not English? Yep. Yep. Back to yourself, Mark. So, uh, go ahead, Mark. Again, Chair, I'll come back with a detailed response on that. One, one of my colleagues, Colin Dunlop, who wasn't able to get on to it, deal directly with that on my behalf. So if I can get back with a, a response to the to the, the committee on that, it would probably be more helpful to be trying to, to, to bluff my way, if I'm honest with you. Okay, thank you, Mark, and we, we look forward to receiving that. Um, Amanda. Uh, just one, well, two things, actually. The first thing is... Um, I hear time being bandied about as if a year or two years is tomorrow, mm -hmm. but for a disabled person that may be their only tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Please keep in mind, we are talking about very severely disabled people mm -hmm. here, and you talking about training GPs in two years' time may be too late for some of us. I have also a question that there is evidence in Great Britain of blanket DNR orders being used inappropriately with disabled people during COVID. Is there any similar data, again that word, or statistics that show how disabled people in Northern Ireland were treated during the pandemic? Why is it that we can choose a DNR, we can choose to die, but we cannot choose to live? The consultant has the final say. Thank you, Thank you Amanda. Well done, Amanda. Thank you. And uh, Mark? Actually, Chair, I can come in on that one. I yep. was um, Gerard Cassidy, Director of Primary Care. Go ahead, Gerard. Um, yeah, Amanda, I'm sorry, thank you for the question. I mean, I mean decisions of um, uh, uh, Cardo, Cardo CPR are um, best made as part of a holistic approach to advanced care planning. Um, I'm aware of the um, the case from England. Um, my understanding from that is that the there was, they didn't, the, uh, the, 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 the Care and Quality Commission England published report in March 2021. Um, which highlighted a number of concerns in relation to DNSCPR. Um, they found few examples of blanket policy, but they did recognise that um, in about a third of cases there was inadequate discussion with patients. And I think that kind of discussion and um, consultation is really important. You're probably aware we have um, a, a consultation at the minute, a policy and advanced care planning. Um, that is looking to kind of really... Uh, broaden the conversation around uh, around 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 end of life care around advanced care planning um, and part of which is around the DNS CPR issue um, the um, it's any blanket um, uh, approach to that would be would be unethical and um, it would is I, I, I don't have any evidence or any any, any data to, to suggest that there has been um, that has been the case in Northern Ireland can I just say from my point of view I'm 57 years of age. I went into the chair when I was 50. I have never, up to the age of 50, been offered a DNR. So far, I've been offered it seven times, minimum seven times. There's something going on. It needs to be looked into. Yeah, no, that's, 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 a, that's a crucial and a very well-made point, Amanda. Thank you. David. Um, David MacDonald, Disabled People's Parliament. Um, Mark, this is addressed to yourself and indeed to the department. Um, I think the department might be in danger of being seen to um, put money out to private providers who are looking to make a profit um, and ignoring how disabled people can help themselves. We don't just sit here and, and uh, as groups um, meet with people to try and uh, improve the lives of all our disabled people and ourselves. We actually run our own services. We look after and employ um, PAs, um, be that with direct payments or be that with the independent living fund. And, and I appreciate that money is tight, but I see no money going towards disabled people themselves mm -hmm. to run their own um, staff. And I think the department needs to reflect on that, um, because when you do say you have no money, but 23 million is going to domiciliary care providers who make a profit, I think some of that money should be considered for disabled people who do not make a profit, who save the department money, and who look after ourselves with a wee bit of help. Mark, thank you, and thank everybody, Chair, um, Deputy Chair, for this today. It's been well worthwhile.
Okay, listen, thank you, and I want to very sincerely thank everyone for what I think, and, and include the panel, I include the Minister, um, and in particular um, the delegates from the Disabled Persons Parliament and those who are here with them today, their PAs, family members in the gallery, and you all. I think it has been a very important day, but more importantly than that, a very productive day. I'm not in the least bit surprised about that. I have witnessed your calibre, your capacity, and your ability to influence a decisions around your own cure on your own behalf and on behalf of other people, but that's of no surprise to me at all. My, my principal wish coming from this meeting is that this will no longer be an unusual or an interesting day in that sense, that it's just routine and regular and happens. In respect of that, I do want to very sincerely welcome the commitment from the, from the Minister and the officials that they will open up an ongoing engagement with the Disabled People's Parliament, and I think that's appropriate and welcome and will be useful for all concerned. Um, I think it's, it's been a huge benefit to, to have you with us today. I want to thank each and every one of you for your time, for your commitment, for your preparation, which was very clear uh, had been in place, and I think made this a very effective session. And again, that doesn't surprise me in the least. So, right. Boramila Mayagov, I wish you and all, all of the people who you represent here today the very best in what are difficult times, but I know that, that, that you are leading in terms of addressing the challenges that people with disability face. We must do much better. I didn't get a chance to ask any of the questions today, but I do have some I want to ask in relation to European Social Funds, in relation to UNCRPD, and how that's going to be implemented, but I will pass those on to the Department via the clerk. But listen, Boromila Moyagov, Beggy Slan, please take care. Thank you. Well done. Yeah. Well done. And members, we're going to take a short pause there and we will resume our meeting at 11.30. We'll resume our meeting at 11.30. Thank you. Your programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly, Senate Chamber, programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly, Senate Chamber, programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly, Senate Chamber, programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed.
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed.
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound.
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound.
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. Sure. Yep. So thank you, members, and we're going to continue then with the rest of today's committee meeting. And I just want to say before we move on that I want to very sincerely thank the engagement teams from both the Assembly here and the Disabled People's Parliament mm -hmm. for putting together and facilitating what has been a very productive uh, initial session with the uh, with the Disabled People's Parliament delegates. Um, I also want to thank the clerk, uh, the clerks, and and the clerks, uh, the team here from. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For facilitating um, that. Okay, members, moving on to chair's business then. In terms of uh, next week, we are facilitating a, a very important and a very um, moving and, 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 uh, and 
informative art event here in the Assembly uh, next week in the Long Gallery. I would ask all members to encourage uh, other, other MLAs, the ministers from their parties and party staff to attend that presentation. Lunch will be available from 12.45 and the presentation will be at 1.15. And I know myself and Pam Cameron have engaged with the group already and I, we can assure you that that is going to be a hugely significant event from women presenting an art uh, installation around uh, secondary breast cancer and, the, and the, uh, the issues arising for them. The other item that I want to touch, a couple of things I want to touch base on this week, I did attend an event yesterday that where the Royal College of OTs, Occupational Therapy, were launching their report. And I have to say it just was another very clear example of the um, range of solutions and expertise that allied health professionals bring to the whole uh, delivery of health and social care and the importance of having their voices and their expertise included in the design and development of, and, and delivery of services. Um, I also want to note the fact that the autism bill has passed its final stage in the Assembly. I think that's a bill we worked extremely hard on. We were delighted to be able to, I think, as a committee, improve even further that bill, and we look forward to seeing its implementation improving the situation for those who are struggling with uh, to get a diagnosis of autism or who have received and then are struggling to get the services that are required. Um, I also attended um, here in, in the building a launch of the BDA, the British Dental Association Manifesto, and I think, and we have discussed uh, that the fact that there are significant issues in dentistry, and I would like to ask members then if we should write to the department urgently to ask them to outline the issues around the Im and the impact of the recent statement that they have made, and how that's impacting on people's ability to access G dentistry uh, on an NHS basis right across our community, including out in rural areas. So we'll uh, we'll we'll ask the uh, the department to we'll ask the, the clerk to to send a, a letter to the department in relation to that. And the final one that I just want to touch upon there was the policy forum event on mental health that, that took place this week, again underlining significant issues of concern around the provision of services for mental health and the deterioration in some regards uh, in, in terms of, of provision of service to those to that sector. So thank you, members. I'm going on then to draft minutes at a tab of the 24th of February, which are tab 3.1 of the pack. Um, are members content with those minutes? Yeah, right. members content. Thank you. I refer members to the draft minutes of the meeting of the 1st of March at tab 3.2 of the pack. Are members content with those? Agreed. Yeah, thank you. Um, Pam, I see your hand raised there. Was that in relation to the, the matters raising? Or, uh, well, I'm on matters raising now, Pam, but I see your hand raised there. Yeah, Chair, I just wanted to come in just on a couple of things there you'd mentioned. I wanted to thank um, the committee and the members um, and the team. Um, behind the committee for all the work that they've done in terms of processing the Autism Amendment Bill. Um, I think I think it was a very proud moment for us in, in the Chamber being able to pass that piece of legislation and something that should make a, an incredible difference going forward um, for the autism community. So I think, especially in light of we're talking about disability today, uh, it's very appropriate that, that that does get another mention. Uh, and just to put on record my thanks to, to all of you as members for, for your support in this bill um, for the old party group work that, is, that has happened. And the other th that item I want to mention was that you'd mentioned the, the BDA event. And I think there are significant issues with dentistry. And uh, could we also add to maybe that uh, communication with the department and, and ask for an update on um, what will happen with the follow time. Uh, obviously, when the pandemic hit, it, it was 60 minutes in between those um, aerosol generating procedures. And then it was just down to substantially down to, I think, maybe 10, 15 minutes. But it's obviously still going to have an impact on capacity uh, and how um, dentists operate. So I wonder, could we just include that to get an update on where that is and whether that's going to remain for the, for the foreseeable future or if there's going to be any change? maybe on a UK-wide basis. Thank you, Pam. Members content that we add that? Yeah. 
Yep, members yep. content, thank you. The other issue that I want to just flag up that we will be discussing in more detail, but just to flag at this stage, we have received some serious and significant correspondence from the Royal College of Nursing um, mm -hmm. highlighting their concerns. We will be discussing that in correspondence, um, so, so just to, to flag that to members. So members, there are no matters arising then other than that from the, uh, from the minutes. And moving on then to our next briefing, which is a departmental briefing on Encompass. So uh, I refer members to the departmental paper at tab 6.1 of the pack. Mm -hmm. And I would now like to welcome to our committee a presentation this morning, Mr. Dan West, who is Chief Digital Information Officer, Department of Health. Dermot and Dan, I sit in between Dermot and Dan. <laughs> I'll sit here. Sorry, Amanda. Where do you want me? Do David, I can go wherever. Where do you want me to go? But I'm just waiting for you to get him to the position. You're waiting for him to get himself sorted out, Amanda, before you could. You're a bad guy. Yep. Oh, I'll get you. I'll get you. Use that one, I'll get you another one. I could have a hole in the square. Do you want to sit in here? Oh, see, he's got one sitting here. Okay, thank you. So, and, uh, so we're joined by Mr. Dan West, Chief Digital Information Officer in the Department of Health, and Dr. Dermot Cuse, who is Senior Responsible Owner in the Un Ulster University. So, um, I'm delighted to have you here today. This has been an issue of, of significant importance, and, and it's become uh, routinely now mentioned around the issue of, of data, so it's good to see you. Uh, here to brief the committee today, um, and we're, we're delighted to have the opportunity to explore and drill into in some more detail the issues around Encompass and uh, how it can benefit us and um, where it's at in, in terms of delivery at the present time. So, Dan, I'll go to yourself then in terms of initial remarks, and if you if you want to make those, I'm not sure if Dr Hughes is making remarks. If you are, then we'll, we'll go to committee members, and if we could keep the remarks as brief as possible, and we'll go to committee members for questions. Brilliant. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, committee members, for the opportunity to come and talk to you on this topic today. Uh, members should have received a document in your packs for today that we'd submitted last week that sets out the goals of the programme and what it means for people in Northern Ireland, both our service users and our staff, as well as some of the benefits in our delivery approach. Uh, I'm going to share the opening remarks here with Dr Hughes, uh, and together we're going to summarise some of what you've already read uh, posing and responding to four simple questions. Why are we doing it? What does it deliver? How are we approaching it? Uh, and when will it all happen? Uh, so I'm going to start with the why are we doing it question. Uh, and I'm going to open with a little bit of our strategic context. And I don't think it's necessary to rehearse for members all of the detail in the strategic backdrop, that being the Donaldson report of 2014, the Bengoa report of 2016, and then the sectoral strategy, health and wellbeing 2026, that was launched in 2016. However, just to put encompass into a bit of context, I'm going to draw out three challenges that you will all recognise. A rapidly ageing population that brings more complex needs. Uh, so by 2039, the population aged 65 and over will increase by 74%, uh, and over 85s will increase by 157% compared to 2014 position. And by the age of 70, nearly 80% uh, of us will have one or more chronic conditions, and by the time we're 80, nearly two-thirds of us will have three or more chronic conditions. So my second point is about health inequalities. Despite living longer, health inequalities continue to divide our society. While overall people are living healthier lives, socio-economic determinants still influence health outcomes. Life expectancy for males in the most deprived areas of Northern Ireland is on average seven and a half years less than their counterparts in the least deprived areas. And the most deprived areas also experience higher prevalence of mental health uh, and uh, higher rates of suicide. And my third context point is about increases in overall demand and changing expectations. Uh, so the increasing prevalence of lifestyle diseases increases demand on the HSC. The ability to offer better, more sophisticated treatments increases demand. And the ability to offer people a better, longer quality of life also increases demand. So the way that most public health economies are currently dealing with these challenges, this rising demand is in a linear fashion. The more demand there is for services, the more financial and human resources are needed to meet that growth and demand. And this is clearly unsustainable. 
Every health economy globally needs to find ways to break that linear relationship between demand and supply. And while digital technology is not the only jigsaw puzzle piece, there's growing evidence that it's an important one. The Encompass programme, our flagship investment amongst a portfolio of digital programmes and projects that addresses this opportunity and enables delivery of the transformation strategy for health and care. Dr Hughes will talk in more detail in a moment about what the Encompass programme is seeking to achieve, but at a high level the business case focuses on four things, patient safety, quality and efficiency, rising demand and constrained resources, uh, support for regional reform and urgent ICT replacements. Um, in my role as Chief Digital Information Officer for the sector, I'm going to add a, a fifth driver which is to support and enable innovation and research through better quality data and more mature information systems. Dr Hughes will pick up the, the second question here about what it is that we're doing. First of all, thanks for giving us the opportunity to talk about this. It, Encompass is not simply an IT project. Encompass is an IT project that enables transformation. It's, the, it's a unique implementation. It includes uh, acute care, mental health and social care. Uh, it, how we deliver it is that we agree standards of care for all patient pathways of care, be it social care or acute care. We do that working with uh, trust members and HSC staff in general. Uh, our first step was in September where we had uh, 5,000 staff for the engagement piece over three days. And then the next step was we formed what they known as e-design groups where we detail all the patient pathways. Uh, and that's done by staff members across all of Northern Ireland. Uh, so we have one solution for all of Northern Ireland. And that's followed on for the next stage, which is, is going to start in the first, what has started in the first of March, actually, uh, where we have 3,000 people going into focus design groups, where we go into the detail of every, of every care pathway. So if you go into the community, there's 1,400 care pathways, uh, and th that will be replicated in the acute sector. The really important thing is that if we standardise against best practice, uh, we will get evidence about how people have been treated, if they've been treated, and the quality of treatment. This will be near real-time data. Northern Ireland is plagued by not quite knowing what's happened and having retrospective lookbacks. This will transform how we manage outcomes and how we manage services. It will mean that we can transfer people to separate areas, but the standards of care will be identical and the processes of care will be identical. Um, the really, really important thing about this, and it's unique to Northern Ireland, is that it includes social and community care. It will derive the health outcomes based on socioeconomic data and it will transform how we commission services. Currently, if you're in social class one, you have really good outcomes. If you're in social class five, you're not so lucky. And, and people should not be dependent on luck for their healthcare outcomes. And, and this is a way to transform what we do and how we do. Uh, so we can shape how we deliver care, but we can shape how we commission care. Brilliant. So how are we doing all of this? Uh, I think Dermot's actually touched on a few of those points. Um, using evidence of what's worked elsewhere is, is the first point. Partnering with this company, Epic, who are bringing us their software tool and learning from their experiences and methodology developed over 500 large hospital deployments in the US market. Now six NHS hospital trusts that use the same system and a number of regional deployments, including social care across Europe. We're going to use a, a foundational system built from those implementations, including those NHS trusts, to start with the tried and tested best practice and tailor it only where required for Northern Ireland specific requirements. We're building a large, clinically led, multi-professional blended team across the core programme, importantly the trusts and these guys from EPIC. Um, and I've got some numbers on the number of resources if it becomes relevant to dip into that in due course. We're going to work really closely with the trusts. This is a, a key point. Um, it's not a programme being done from the centre to the trusts. This is something that the trusts are going to be pulling through, given the benefit to them uh, and their service users. Uh, and, and all of that is based around clinical and operational input. And there are large numbers of staff that have already engaged in those processes that Dermot was just describing. Uh, and we're building a large governance and decision-making apparatus that puts the design of end-to-end -end services into the hands of these clinical staff, social workers, nurses and midwives, pharmacists and allied health professionals. And we'll finish up just in our opening remarks in the evidence session with a little bit of a view on, on some of the dates. And I think, Dermot, you're going to pick that up. When, when are we delivering the programme? Yeah. Uh, to date, we're in the initial phases, and we hope to do the, the first implementation is due for... Uh, post-summer in 2023, 
and we're going to do it stepwise uh, by trust by trust. Uh, we have a, an end date of the end of 2025. That will not change. We have legacy systems that need to be replaced. The, the program is replacing 70 systems. So, so we have a set end date. Uh, and it's, as we learn as we go along, it's an iterative process, though, that if we learn something new, it will be applied to all the trusts as we go forward. And we, and we leave a period of six months at the end to optimise the systems. So it, it's quite a unique implementation that elsewhere it's normally been done onto one healthcare system, and so there's a whole province, and of course it's unique because it's uh, the community. The, the other added benefit that we're going to implement is a thing called MyChart. It's a patient portal where patients have access to their own notes, uh, records, uh, results, uh, and that will be in a structured way. So it empowers patients and it empower, it changes the relationship, I believe, with healthcare professionals and patients attending. And so that's a cultural change, and I think it's an important cultural change because uh, well, the, my personal view is, is that healthcare can be patriarchal at times uh, and not open and transparent as it should be. Uh, and this would be a radical change. And this is a challenge as well. Okay, thank you. Um, and I suppose it is, it is a, certainly something that, that we have sort of from the very outset of the committee looked at as something of huge importance. We have we've discussed now earlier today the issue of data collection here, the issue of how we capture. So the data is flowing through the system in every health interaction there is. It's a question of how we're capturing it and then how we're analysing it and breaking it down. So I suppose it is disappointing that it's not further along the, the, the pathway. And I note that you said there, Dermot, around post, uh, post-summer 2023, but there had been a previous indication that the South Eastern Trust, and this was a department press release, the South Eastern Trust will be the first trust to go live in 2022. So why has the programme not met its dates in relation to that, and how many delays have there been in yeah, the programme? Th there have been two delays in the programme, and uh, they have been related to availability of staff. While you can build the IT system, if you don't have the staff intelligence and the staff knowledge about the pathways and how you build it, it, you will not have a meaningful system. So that during the COVID pandemic, we, we could not take the risk of removing patients from frontline staff to do this piece of work because of the, the numbers of staff we're removing at any one time, 5,000 for the engagement piece, 800 for the EDG group, and then now we're, we're doing uh, 3,000 staff. Uh, and it, to get people to focus on the future when we're dealing with the pandemic, we had to make a decision. What was safe was best, in the best interest of patients, and the delay was the best interest in patients at that time. Post-pandemic, although we're not quite really post-pandemic yet, uh, staff are in a different place and ready to move on with this. Um, it, it's a substantial piece of work. Uh, and a su substantial ask of the clinical staff and the social care staff to give up their time and to agree against international best practice and then build that into a, com a computer system. Uh, so it, it's not a simple task and it, it's not an easy task, but it's a really worthwhile task. Um, I, I think the delays, while disappointing, are understandable. Uh, and I think in the best interest of patients at that time, given the state of the health services. And so you've, you've dealt with the post-pandemic ones. Were there, were there delays pre-pandemic that have impacted on the rollout? No. no so there's no. The two delays. The first one was decided upon in early 2021, uh, and that was a delay of six months that accumulated as a function of trying to launch the programme in the course of a global pandemic, wave one and wave two of the uh, pandemic in Northern Ireland. Um, we then, when Omicron was upon us more recently, um, it was clear that we weren't going to be able to attract in the design phase that we were in at that point in time earlier this year and kind of tail end of last year, we just couldn't bring clinical staff out of frontline facing clinical roles into this conversation about the future. It wasn't practical. And frankly, if we tried to do it, it wouldn't have been safe to then deploy a product that came out of the back of that because we didn't have uh, a consensus on how we wanted to engineer these pathways of care in the future. So we took a, a, a pause in concert um, as a, a kind of senior level decision in the department with the chief medical officer and others uh, for seven weeks, basically January and February. Um, we are dealing with now a replanning exercise that handles the repercussions of that delay on the programme uh, and all aspects of the programme ranging from buying the infrastructure. There are global supply chain delays on all 
IT infrastructure as a function of what's happened in the world over the last couple of years. So we have to bake that into a replanning exercise that's going on at the moment. The, the programme board decided just last Friday that we'd be going for a post-summer date, and that's the second official delay in the programme. Uh, and we're finalising exactly what that means. It's, it's probably a September, October date for the first go live next year. There's a delay, but not the end. NA. The end date will stay the same. OK, and uh, if you could come back to us with, with an update on that when, when you've completed that, that uh, analysis of, of, of that. Um, Absolutely. That would be useful, Dan. The, uh, the second one was then that I wanted to ask you in relation to engagement. So how are you facilitating the uh, patient voice in relation to that? We have had a very, uh, very useful session this morning with the Disabled People's Parliament as, as one example of, of people who are obviously have a very huge vested interest in good data and data available in a way that improves services. So how, are you, how have you been engaging and what are your plans for engagement into the future and throughout the rollout? So during the um, earlier stages of the programme where we were designing what this programme was about and choosing in particular the, the product, which has both the staff side functionality, but also, as Dermot mentioned a moment ago, there's this portal that we would offer to patients and they can book appointments, interact with their healthcare professionals, um, receive uh, test results, uh, and also receive coaching I'm, I'm and referring guidance. To, I'm referring to their in, input into designing the Got system so, rather than using the system. Got it. So the, the reason that it was important to involve them in the selection of the product was to make sure that we had their opinion. So the Patient Client Council was engaged and they provided a number of uh, citizens who came and sat in on those early stages of the programme. That's become more challenging recently. Our plan is to, to review with Patient Client Council continued citizen and patient involvement in the programme during deployment. At the moment, we don't have a great deal of patients involved right now, although in previous stages of the programme, we have had heavy patient involvement in decision making. And why wouldn't you have them throughout? Uh, it, the, the ability to provide patients into meetings and boards um, has been very difficult during COVID. What about Zoom, Dan? Yeah, there's loads of techniques. You, you, know, would, we, expect, you, you guys... would expect the department's tag guru yeah. <laughs> be able to, to be able to in, in involve people through the medium of Zoom, if, not, if, if nothing else. Got it. It's, I'm, I'm not trying to defend where we are. The, the place that we're in at the moment, just being completely honest with you, is we don't really have a great deal of patient and client involvement in the programme processes today, and, and we're not happy about that, and we're going to do some work to make sure that we correct that. Yeah, it, should, it, it, shouldn't be, it, it needs to be absolutely okay. intrinsic. It shouldn't be an add-on. I agree. We fully, fully take that on board. Um, we do interface with many of the networks who have patient uh, representation, but I believe the, my portal, the, the patient, my chart, the patient access point is, is so critical. That really needs to be patient designed. And, 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 that's like, that. like that, that's, and I make this point all the time. That's not solely, although, although it would be to patients' benefit, actually, the greater beneficiaries of it would be yourselves. Yeah. In, in realising what the issues are, how to navigate around them. So, so that's, that's the... OK, listen, so I, I do welcome that commitment and I would like to see some detail maybe presented back as to how that's going to actually happen. No problems. On an ongoing basis and, and to be an intrinsic part of that process. OK, thank you. The final one for me then before I go to members is around um, cost. So what is the expected overall cost at this point in time? What have been the cost to date? And how much money has been paid out to third-party consultants at this point in time? Uh, there's a table in the pack. So rather than read out a load of figures for you, I would uh, refer members on that question to the table in the pack that shows the overall budget. And we'd split that capital and revenue. The, the total budget from a capital perspective is that 261 million number. And the total budget from a revenue perspective is 224 million over the uh, project life cycle. You can see the amount of spend that has been occurred to date over the couple of years that we've been running the programme. That's in the table as well. Um, the exact figure that we've paid, uh, splitting it up to uh, external versus internal costs, I'd have to get back to you on that. I don't have that uh, at my fingertips just now. OK, and that, that, that was so... Uh, OK, well, listen, come, do come back to me with that. Um, and, and it's worth, I guess, being clear, sorry, in your question, uh, you talked about external consultants, so uh, we don't have external consulting resources doing management consulting on the programme. We have a staff substitution arrangement where there are external parties who are providing us resources on a staff substitution basis, 
for staff that we are unable to attract and recruit within the programme. So the, the, there is a bit of a distinction given the approval process for management consulting is, is different than a staff substitution approval process. But I'll split it out so that you see what we're paying to Epic, the yeah. software vendor, uh, and what we're paying to external parties that are helping with programme delivery. So are you saying, are you saying essentially you're using an agency arrangement to backfill staff who are working on this programme? Is yep. that what? Yes, yes. Okay, so if you, can, if you can give me the cost of that to date and the, and the, the uh, predicted costs for that. Thank Will you. Do. Okay, thank you, Dan, and uh, thank you, Dr Hughes. I'm going to go to uh, members now, and the first member I have then is uh, Paula. Go ahead, Paula, please. Chair, would you come back to me at the end? I've got a big long list, and I'm hoping other people get to my questions first. Okay, so I'll go ahead then to other committee members. Now, I do see Pam's hand raised. I'm not sure if that's from previously, uh, but Pam, do you have a question, or do you want to come in at this point, Pam, with a comment or question? Yes, please, Chair. Thank you, and uh, thank you, Dan and uh, Dr. Hughes, for your attendance today. I've been waiting for this uh, presentation for uh, a considerable length of time. I've been um, bleating on about um, hearing more about Encompass, so very welcome and thank you for the information provided. Um, this is, I think, an, an exciting project, and it's, it's something we want to see. And I am disappointed to hear that the project has been delayed um, twice. Uh, and, but obviously, we are where we are, and uh, the pandemic has had a very negative effect on, on so many areas. It's just unfortunate that whilst our willingness are, are rocketing through the roof, that um, and the one thing that could actually help in terms of transform, transformation is this Encompass programme, that, that this too has been delayed because of the pandemic. So it feels like we're running around in circles at, at times. But I wonder, could you um, answer a couple of questions and then maybe give us some practical examples of uh, the outworking of the Encompass um, programme? Um, so I wanted to ask, first of all, why um, the Southeastern um, Health and Social Care Trust was selected uh, to go live first. And if you could talk to us about um, if there are working estimates of how, roughly how much staff time will be freed up as a result of the new digital solution. Um, and it, could you also tell Encompass will be agile enough to um, to flex to whatever transformation agenda is agreed by a new executive coming in in the new mandate? And then in terms of the practical working examples, if you could talk us through what it would mean um, practically for a patient on the ground and maybe give us another example, for instance, a social worker, what Encompass might mean for their workload, because we, we hear often about how they are uh, bogged down with, with paperwork and, and and don't actually have time to do um, their trained profession work because of that. So if you could talk us through some of those issues, please. Very good. Uh, thank you. Uh, I, I'm going to split those four questions up. I'm going to try and tackle the first three, and then I'm going to go to Dr Hughes for the last one about um, sort of worked examples and what it means from a social care perspective. Uh, one of the questions that we had prepared uh, an answer to, because we thought you might ask it, is how is this investment actually going to help with the macro level problems in healthcare, like, for instance, waiting lists? So I, I think some of what we'd prepared there might actually be quite interested in responding to that. So why the South East Trust? Um, th they're not the biggest. Going for Belfast first, based on the guidance that we got from experts uh, and uh, the company Epic that we've brought in is, is don't go for your biggest trust first. Um, so that put Belfast something other than first. Um, the, the advice was um, probably go for your big one second because you've, you've ironed out some of the kinks with another trust uh, and, and then you get the big bang for your book by rolling out in the, in the big centre which has the uh, tertiary services like the Belfast Trust. Um, the reason that we chose the South East is um, because they, they fit the characteristic that I've just described and they volunteered to go first. <laughs> uh, so as simple as that. And, and they are um, pretty technologically advanced as a trust uh, and they were enthusiastic and ready to embrace the change and embrace the challenges that this change brings with it. Um, on uh, how much we are able to liberate in the efficiency that the system will bring, um, the benefits uh, are a combination of, in the business case, cash releasing benefits um, and then uh, capacity benefits. So capacity that will be liberated within the system that won't be cashed out. Uh, and that annual benefits profile, um, both across re cash releasing and non-cash releasing, is 77 million. Um, 
about five or six of it is the cash releasing bit. So just in the interest of rounding, let's say about 70 million's worth of um, capacity benefits within the system across the five trusts is what's described in the business case and the challenge then for the programme team and the trusts to deliver, to liberate that capacity in a way that's meaningful in terms of addressing you know, the big challenges and problems within healthcare in Northern Ireland. Um, on the third part of your question, the agile transformation agenda, um, if the new executive decides that we need a new strategy for transformation of health and care, it is the platform um, scalable and flexible in a way that would allow us to, to, to bend to the needs of a new transformation agenda. Um, yes, in theory, what we're building is a platform that allows us to collect better data and collect better data better for, our, in particular, our staff members. Uh, and that's a good thing and would underpin, um, at least from my perspective, any transformation direction that we take in the future. But it's a bit difficult to say definitively until we see what the, the new transformation um, objectives and priorities are. Um, I'll hand to Dr Hughes uh, for the fourth part of your question. Yeah. Uh, th thanks very much for your question. Uh, the principle for social care is, is actually the same as, as all pathways that we're discussing. Uh, it, the process is about getting staff together to agree uh, Northern Ireland-wide uh, pathways of care, and that's uh, benchmarked against uh, best evidence, uh, NICE or, or other national guidance. Uh, and the process is not simply about replicating what we currently do because obviously what we do currently sometimes isn't productive and doesn't work. It's about streamlining what we do. It's about making it a system that supports, a system that reduces the, the um, onerous paperwork. And, and we've evolved into situations where the paperwork is so onerous that it prevents the care, be that social care or health care. And that's what we want to strip out of the system. We want to have an intelligence system that, that gives aids, hints and reminders. Uh, and we want to change how we interact with our patients, especially our social care users, uh, especially through the MyPorter process, where people can seek advice intermittently at distance, as well as having face-to-face -face visits. I, I'm very conscious of um, the social care aspects, because people are so busy doing their day-to-day -day job and the owner's paperwork that sometimes the change could be challenging, just as free up time to do that. But the service will not improve unless we go through that process of agreeing what's necessary, what's unnecessary, uh, what documentation is essential and what's superfluous, and, and building in systems that actually make that doable and achievable. Yep. Pam, go ahead. Thank, thank you for your responses there. Um, I wonder, could you then t tell us a bit more about um, how, obviously this is this will be huge change, and whilst I'm complaining that there's a delay, it's also not too far away from starting, and, and you know, it's a year and a bit away, um, and that's very exciting, but it'll, it'll also be very new, it'll also be a huge change for, for patients and staff. So, you know, how will um, how will that training be rolled out and how will you communicate um, the huge change, a uh, huge cultural change you've already alluded to um, for both patients and staff in, in the use of this new system? Yeah, I, I, I think the, the first thing we do is we collect the intelligence of implementations to date. We look at where it's gone right and where it's gone wrong. We're very upfront and clear with staff, the areas that we need to make sure that are, are addressed in advance. Uh, I think the training is the sort of primary factor that, uh, around the, the system EPIC. They, they train people individually. There's a, an accredited program, and you have to achieve competencies before you can use the system. But as well as that, they have a, a super user program, and we try to have uh, maybe between one and four to one and six people trained up in this, this super user status. So it means that if you're on the ward or if you're in the operating theatre, you sort of have an expert at elbows length so that you're never le left struggling with the system. That There will be a downturn in productivity at the um, process of implementation and, and we have to understand that and manage that very clearly on a day by day, week by week basis. The good news is that once you use this system, you have day by day, week by week data. To, to measure and monitor, and, and then th that, that comes back. The, the important thing is not only must it be safe for staff, but it must be safe for patients using the service at the time of implementation. So we have to put checks and balances in and perhaps maybe reduce 
by patients for a very short period of time so, so that when the implementation happens. And, and we're very conscious of that. Uh, the other good thing about doing it in North Ireland in a stepwise fashion is that we can learn from trust to trust so that we can have a range of super users ready and willing once the first trust go in, but they will have some experience in working in the first trust. Yeah, I'd, I would just add to that that um, at the, the super user training and, and training is such a huge part of the deployment programme uh, and it's a, it's a very large part of the investment. Um, getting everybody accredited and comfortable using the application is, is going to be one of the key things. Um, there are very personalised bits of training that we do, particularly for senior clinicians, medics and, and other um, professionals, um, where we don't just teach them in a classroom how to use the application, but we actually work with them to figure out how best they want to interact with those services. So it's a very personalised training approach. And then there's, there's something called at-the-elbow support, um, which is really important. So you can sit somebody in a classroom and train them about an application and all of the different things that it does, uh, and it may then be a number of days or weeks before they actually need to use it to do that thing. Uh, so really crucially, they either turn to a super user or there'll be, there'll be floor walkers at the elbow support that can drop in and say, look, you might have forgotten exactly how to do it. Let me remind you and work through what's the best way to do that. So a combination of of mitigations in this great big business change program that we're running to make sure that people are comfortable and content to use it before we press the go button on a trust by trust basis okay pam. thank you okay thank you pam so i'm going then to carol and then colin so nice to meet you and thank you carol Grimogat. um in relation to so in the department's press release, it said there was three hundred million of ICT investment over ten years, and it'll create around two hundred jobs. So, additional jobs. So it's not the backfill from what's there now; it's additionality. So, my first question is: What is that additionality? Is it all agency staff, and how are they all recruited? So, if you could answer that. My second question is this. Um, so, in terms of procurement and tendering, um, what procurement exercises, tendering and commissioning have taken place to ensure that there is openness and transparency around all this? So, if you could just answer those, and then I'll come back to my third, which is very small. Thank you. Okay, perfect. So, our plan is to recruit resources um, as either permanent or temporary HSC staff members into the programme team. And as you say, the number is about 200. Uh, it's, it's actually 231 at peak. Okay. So there's 162 resources at peak in the regional programme team, uh, 44 in the trust side programme teams, and then 25 professional leads, five across each of the five trusts. So that's a total of 231 at, at max. Um, the plan was to have those 231 all be um, permanent or temporary staff members. Uh, our recruitment has not allowed us to appoint staff members at the rate that we need to based on plan A, which is all of these people being HSC employees. Uh, so as a tactical decision last year, in order to maintain momentum on the programme, we've brought in the, the, these external agency workers to come in on a temporary basis currently. And that was, a, that was a tactical decision just to keep the thing moving because recruitment's been particularly challenging during COVID. It's particularly challenging all of the time at the moment, let's be fair. Um, but it was, it was really difficult during COVID for people to think about coming out of frontline roles and coming into uh, a programme uh, which isn't about the day-to-day -day of management of the burden of the pandemic. Um, we are... Uh, working through the recruitment plan to try and attract these resources on a permanent basis and therefore reduce over time our dependency on this um, external agency approach that we've used at the minute. Um, so that was the, the recruitment question there. On procurement, um, the programme uh, is working alongside um, PALS, which is part of BSO, the Procurement and Logistics Service, which is the um, Centre of Procurement Excellence for Health and Care in Northern Ireland uh, that takes all of the Northern Ireland-wide procurement policies used in government generally and applies them in the health and care sector and brings the procurement expertise to programmes. Uh, and we have followed the, the kind of due process and policy around how you would buy software through using 
um, you know, well-trodden publication of RFIs and associated documentation to receive bids from uh, vendors in the marketplace. I don't know whether that actually answers the question that you're, you're seeking No, but there. we can follow up at the end, um, rather than hogging this, we can follow up at the end. My last question is just the, the small one is, have you briefed the Permanent Secretary and will you be briefing the Permanent Secretary when the Assembly is dissolved until a new Minister is put in and a new mandate? Yes, our PermSec is well briefed on what's going on on the programme. Um, uh, and, yeah, we'll continue to do that. When was the last briefing with the PermSec? We met with Richard a week last Friday. OK. Thank you, Chair. I'll follow up at the end. Thank you, Carl. Going across on Thank the video you. screen then to Colin McGrath. Go ahead, Colin, please. Thank you very much, um, Chair. And I suppose you'll have to get a, a new permanent secretary up to date if what was announced last night is to be uh, a, a implemented. Um, I suppose, uh, Chair, I suppose these questions are maybe a wee bit more about the practical side of this project. And what I was thinking of is, you know, there, there's a, an opportunity for people to be able to interact and book appointments and do other bits and pieces as part of this project. And I was just wondering what consideration there would be, A, for um, people maybe that aren't able to avail of technology, and then B, about maybe where the services might break down. Is there a backup plan uh, or something that's there to be able to... To, to step in place if things shouldn't work. And then we did see uh, in various places in Europe, and I think in the South, about um, where cyber attacks can come in and people's information could be could be garnished. So I'm just wondering what sort of uh, inbuilt protections there are on those fronts. OK. Um, so I've, I've got backup plan uh, and cyber attack as two questions. There, there was something at the start of that about... Um, how people would interact and book appointments. Could you just clarify the question that you're after there, please? So just when this system is up, is there, uh, uh, will there be interactions for um, patients, for example, to be able to use technology and use the system to book appointments or to be able to avail of services? And it's just what would happen for those that aren't um, au fait with technology? Will there be alternative routes or for, for them to be able to access services or access their information? Yeah, I'll take the first question. Uh, the, the, the my portal or the my chart. Uh, patients will be able to access and book, book their own appointments. Uh, the caveat is, if the people are not uh, comfortable with digital, the, the, the normal service is, will stay in place, uh, and that that's our, our, our standard of care. Uh, the, the digital access means that people should be able to book and choose, and as we have standardised care across Northern Ireland, you may be able to book and choose in different areas, and that's part of the transformation programme that this will enable. Um, people will have standardised uh, access pathways for all care. If they're going for surgery, they'll have standardised pre-assessment across Northern Ireland. So, so that will uh, enable more efficiency in the system and a more flexible system, but we're, we're very conscious that not everybody's IT enabled and not everybody can access the system that way. So the old fashioned way or the, the normal, the current system will still exist. And then on the two other parts of the question, um, the sort of business continuity implications of implementing one big system um, to support business operations. So th there is already um, business continuity plans in place in each of the organisations in health and care, as, as you would expect. Uh, and that surfaces in the Joint Emergency Response Plan in the event that there is a business continuity impact across multiple different organisations, as, as we have seen recently with the pandemic. Um, those plans, both at the individual organisation level and at the Northern Ireland-wide sectoral level, deal with what to do in the event that there is an outage of, of a, one or more IT systems that um, means that there's a loss of functionality and data to support delivery of clinical and operational services. Um, I think the, the point you're making here is, given that we are buying this one great big application uh, that's replacing lots of other IT systems, have we thought about any enhanced risk that that brings in terms of our business continuity plans and the overall joint emergency response plan? Um, uh, it's a good point. I'm, I'll go away and work with the team and just make sure that we haven't forgotten to go back and just check the business continuity documents. Uh, I don't know definitively the answer to that, but I, I think it's a good question, so we'll take it away. The, the infrastructure that we're building um, for supporting the application, recognising how critical 
the EPIC system will be to healthcare and, and social care in Northern Ireland. Um, we've designed it in such a way that it's got all of the fail-safes that you would expect from a modern IT system. So we've got you know, not one data centre that might have a problem. We've got two data centres and replication of the data across those two data centres and all of the associated infrastructure resilience that you would expect at the network level. Um, so all of that has been designed in. I can give you assurances that that's how we're building and buying the technology. Um, Cyber is another really good question and actually has a relationship with business continuity and the joint emergency response plan. Obviously, these are sort of adjacent to one another. Um, the uh, infrastructure procurement and configuration part of the programme that I've just described briefly in relation to business continuity, that is being done in accordance with our policies to reduce and avoid the likelihood of cyber attack. Um, but the the cyber threat landscape in healthcare economies around the world isn't just about our systems and data. Um, the biggest threat vector for cyber attack these days is human beings um, and, and people uh, responding to spear phishing attacks from cyber criminals uh, that would then give them access to networks where they can um, secure privileged account details, log into active directories and breach an active directory, which is part of the issue that happened in, in the Republic of Ireland recently that's been so detrimental to health and care services there. So what we have in Northern Ireland outside the Encompass programme um, is a portfolio of digital investments that includes um, a new cyber investment where we're going to be um, building some new technologies and also focusing on the human aspects of cyber security with training and um, uh, phishing attack synthesization and all of those kinds of things that help people to realize that they have an accountability and a responsibility around privacy and security of data. So that program is, is a separate part of my portfolio of investments um, and is key uh, to making sure that all of our applications, including the EPIC one, are safe and secure. Okay. Really interesting, and thank, thank you for the answers, Chair. That's Grant. Thank you very much indeed. Yeah, and just just picking up on, on that issue, and I'm not sure if it was fully covered, but in terms of the outdated system, some of the systems being outdated and the transfer across, has that an impact on patient uh, delivery of, of care, or how is that going to be um, managed? It is the question about migration of data and functionality from existing systems to the new system? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And the fact that, as you say on your website, that many of the existing systems already are outdated. So um, how is that migrating across? Um, so the, the programme includes uh, migration of data to make sure that we have all of the information that we need to continue to provide patient care uh, and migration of functionality from one system to another system as part of the training exercise and our go-live preparations for each of the trusts to make sure that if you work in radiology, you know what part of the EPIC application is going to re replace what part of your current systems. And, and you know, the same logic applies to all medical clinical disciplines. Um, the, the reduction of risk is part of the programme plan and methodology that we're bringing from our vendor who's done this hundreds and hundreds of times across large hospitals around the world. And, and Dermot mentioned earlier that what we are the, expecting what, some what productivity reduction. There? Vendor. What? Vendor? And vendor. Yeah, vendor. vendor. Yeah. yeah, the vendor. And what, what is their input? Uh, the plan that we're using in the programme, the, the basis of the methodology for delivering this new application, comes from Epic, okay. the, which is the vendor. Yeah. They've done this... Oh, yes, yes, times. okay. That, the vendor, yes, yeah, sorry. Vendor, I, I yeah. misunderstood. Sorry. That's my, that's my okay. funny accent. Go ahead. Yep, sorry that, about that. That's fine. Okay, thank you, Dan. Did you want to come in on any of that, Dan, no, particularly no, no, about no, productivity? No. Okay. Yeah. okay, so I'll come back to you, Paula. Okay, thank you, Chair, and thank you. Um, okay, my first question is in relation to interfamily linkages, and is there the opportunity within this system to call forward for screening those people who would be genetically more disposed to certain health conditions? First question. Second question is in relation to the yellow cards. Well, when I've supported patients with, to the um, management or leadership of the Department of Health around hernia mesh implants, for example, they said they just didn't have the data around where there had been complications. And I'm just wondering to what degree do, will this system allow patients to feed in any complications they have with, with the treatment? Um, third question is in relation to support for self care. Um, during the pandemic, I found sending people the link, for example, to the Royal College of Midwifery's advice on handling COVID. To what degree to 
Will there be parts of this portal that you will actually direct people to external sites? And finally, um, you, you, you mentioned there, Dr Hughes, um, all care pathways. You'll be aware that there, there's disparities in some care pathways, for example, ME. And, and to what degree will this actually flag up where there are deficiencies in postcode lotteries in terms of care pathways? Thank you. Do you want to pick those up? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so start at the back. Care path, um, before it was, did this job, was the medical director of the Western Hospital. Before that, it was the medical director of the Northern Ireland Cancer Network. And, and part of that work was about making sure people had a standard of care, because there was there's disparities hidden throughout the, the health and care, social care system. And part of this process, and probably the most important part of this process, is the robust discussion amongst staff to say, what, what is the way forward for Northern Ireland? So there would be one standard of care for all patients for specific disease and drive that, ver drive that variance out and, and make sure that it benchmark it against the international best standards. So, so that will be embedded in the system. So it's not simply a, a, a system to record information. It records every step in that patient's pathway so, so that you can get assurances and you get real-time data to ensure that that's happening. So, so that, will, that, that will be addressed. Uh, the issue about the um, yellow cards, that, that's a part of the safety issue. And so, some of the data that we sent out in the, um, the pack phase has some figures from there about me medicines, uh, complications, and how that data is collected. Um, and will there be transparency for the patient around that? Because, you know, in terms of informed decision making, you know. Yes. Yeah, it will be, it will, it will be transparent because the patient will have access to their notes through my patient portal. Sorry to labour this, Chair, but um, part, part of the issue is that if somebody then is sitting with their consultant and saying, here's, here's what we recommend, your treatment pathway, then somebody else could, so they, they, they could then look to see what other people's experience has been of it, for example. And that's the issue because they just didn't have the quant it hadn't quantified how many people had actually had difficulties with that certain um, procedure, for example. Yeah, the, the, the system has great ability to collect data from multiple, multiple people. Uh, and I, that will be part of the th information they collect. You're talking about the yellow cards that, that, that are currently filled in by hand uh, when there's a side effect from medication? Yeah, but I'm saying not, not all patients are aware of that system and stuff. So it's yeah. more that somebody can say, going into my charts, I'm having difficulty with this and finding you know, um, isolated pain or you know, trouble sleeping and stuff like that. It's really just to, to give feedback in terms of what complications are so, on for so the, surgery, the, for example. The patient portal will give um, patients, clients and their carers uh, access to information about the patient that actually currently is really hard for patients to get access to. Um, that will allow them and, and kind of galvanise them in their care continuum in, in a way that we haven't been able to before. Not everybody will be able to avail of that or will want to. Some will want a more traditional relationship with their um, healthcare professionals, and that's fine too. But those that are a bit more digitally enabled, and actually, last time I was here, we were talking about the Stop COVID app. So, so there are people in Northern Ireland. There's a growing evidence that lots of people in Northern Ireland do want to interact with healthcare services digitally. Um, that will improve their experience. Um, if there are contraindications about um, medication. Um, the yellow card process and, and submission of that back to the Medicines and Healthcare Products Regulatory Agency isn't really in the public consciousness. Um, uh, I think some people understand that, many people don't. The, the informed conversation between a healthcare professional and their patient um, is going to be better because there's more availability and access of information. It's not going to be a panacea for appropriate recording of um, yellow card type information through that interaction, but it, it's down to the, the healthcare professionals to make sure that they're capturing and then submitting that information in an informed way, would, would be my view. And I, I think there's a similar question here about um, the point you made about signposting of people to information resources outside of um, health and social care offered communications platforms like the Health and Social Care Board website, for instance. Um, the portal isn't going to proactively signpost people to other resources, but I think there is a, a broader sort of communications opportunity um, where we can have a single place for people to go um, that sits alongside the patient portal, which is where they access their data and information, where we can provide links to useful resources and signpost people to the Royal College of Midwifery if there's, if there's good advice and guidance there. Uh, but I, I don't think that's well, I, I know that that's not part of the Encompass programme scope at the moment, to think about that broader communications opportunity. Um, 
it, it's, it's, a, it's a good thought, and I might have to come back to you on what collectively we want to try and do with that. I just think self-care, obviously, we don't have all the resources to deal with it. I think the last one was around inter-family linkages in terms of patient records so that people can be identified earlier. So it's technically possible okay. to look at family relationships in the application, but you've got to be a little bit careful here about um, consent and information governance and privacy. So you will use healthcare information stored within the system to provide primary healthcare services to an individual based on the consent that they provide for their information to be stored within the application. Um, you need to think about how you then create that consent model for identifying individuals based on a family linkage that you hold within that system to then go and offer them a service or, or interact with them about their healthcare needs. And that question actually came up this week. Um, We'd need to look at that from an information governance perspective as to how we would try and have that kind of propagating family linkage um, done within the application. Yeah. Dermot, do you want to come in on that? No, I mean, I, I think it's, it's a very important question because with growing molecular technology, this will become a bigger and bigger problem. And it's how, how you share data appropriately with consent mm -hmm. in the electronic system. It's a very unidirectional process. It's your record, it's your consent, it's yeah. your information. Uh, and it's more of a legal construct around it rather than an IT construct. Sharing the data electronically is probably not difficult. Mm -hmm. it's, it's getting the legal uh, structure around it is the important thing. Okay, as long as it's on your radar. Thank you. Thank you, okay, Chair. Thank you. Um, Arlea, yes, go ahead. Go ahead. Thanks very much Hi. for your presentation today. Um, so my first question was around, you yes, mentioned earlier, around the two delays um, during the, the pandemic. And I'm just wondering, has there, was there a cost to those delays? Um, you know, so has the cost increased to implement the, in the Encompass programme as a result of the, the delays that you have um, undergone? Uh, not currently. We're, as, as I said earlier when we were talking about the second of the delays that we took recently during Omicron, we're still dealing with the repercussions of that. Um, we've got the programme board just last Friday um, aligned around the need to move the date um, to incorporate the Omicron slippage, as well as other delay factors like the global supply chain for infrastructure implementation. Um, uh, the, that date, the new date, September, October, probably, um, is going to allow us to do a reprofiling of the finances. We don't currently think that we have breached the original approved spending envelope. Um, we're just moving the dates around and, and thinning out some of the activity that's been going on, particularly during the pandemic. Um, but we'll know that in due course. I've already agreed to come back to chair um, with the confirmation of that plan date. So maybe once we've done that financial reprofiling, I could perhaps include that in a briefing for you guys. Yes, that, that the, the contract with the, the, the vendor, it wasn't lump sums every year. Mm. It, it was based on, on, on time and materials. So as the, the, the workflow decreased, the, their cost decreased. So that was a bit of the protection when there was a downturn in clinical work. Yep, no, and th those updates would, would be great because I know in previous... Um, sessions that we've done around the budget and obviously the, the significant investment that's going into the Encompass programme. Um, it would just be obviously beneficial to be utilising all of that towards the programme. So, you know, any other money, there, as you know, there's a million and one things that we need to be investing in alongside it. Um, but yes, that, that would be much appreciated then, a wee update on that. And then I was just wondering, um, I can't remember who raised it earlier, but you were touching on then, um, so the training for the staff when the programme is um, up and running, and then also then giving people the ability to um, go online to make bookings or, or whatever way that, that process will work out. And I'm just wondering then, so aside from the training of staff, is there going to be any sort of uh, public PR element to like, communicate out to the wider population so people are aware of the consent we're issues and the sharing? We're just in the process of launching a website, and that's a public facing website in the first instance, and, and we will put out extensive uh, information and training on that. Uh, obviously, we, we can't train one-to-one -one the, mm -hmm. the population, but we believe there, there is quite a lot of digital intelligence in, in the community, uh, and that we will provide supportive information in, in that way. Um, certainly, we invest heavily in training of staff, and, and part, of, part of the roles that some of the implementations have done, when people have changed jobs, they actually take that role on to train new staff and, and train members of the public who so wish to learn that mm -hmm. when they're up for their appointments and, 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 we, and we can do innovative things like that. No, that's really helpful. Thank you. And then just finally, um, so you will be aware that there's obviously work um, underway at the moment to create a regional mental health service. 
and in some of the discussions that I've been having with some of the, the individuals and the groups that are involved in, in rolling out that regional sort of model. Um, there's been some talk about, you know, like their input into then how the, the Encompass programme will be will be rolled out. And I'm just wondering, so how you are finding, you know, the different input from the different sectors and are you encountering any challenges um, in terms of, you know, will, will this Encompass programme share information between statutory, community and voluntary, primary care? Is it right across the board and how you're sort of getting a feel for all that, how it will work out? The, the, the information will be available in primary care on a read-only basis, they, they can't amend it. Uh, sharing with statutory bodies is, is again, that will be on the same basis. Sharing with voluntary bodies is more of a challenge and, and, and in voluntary bodies are so important in, in mental health as opposed to maybe acute care or other sectors of the health care and, and that's something we are we're trying to work through at the moment whether we can accredit them and give them read-only access but but that we haven't resolved that at present okay no thank you very much thank you very much okay thank you earlier yeah thank you and that's and, and that's that's interesting and i think um I don't have any other indications from members there, but it is a, it is one that and, and it was raised earlier in the session around the need for the need for data to be human and qualitative as well as as well as the I suppose what you could refer to as the yeah. cold data, and they're both important. And, and you know, I think in terms of transformation, we absolutely need the data. We need it to be accurate. We need it to be uh, encompassing, for want of a better word, all of all of the all of the areas, and um, because. That old truism about what gets measured gets done. So we need to make sure the right things are being measured, that things are being measured equitably. But also, I think it is important, as Joanne raised earlier, the need to have a human and a qualitative both input and output from the system. How will that be managed, or, or how do you bridge that, or include both? You don't. You don't. How do you include both of those within I, a data I, I, system? I can respond to that. And it's remiss of me of not saying. Um, the, the patient portal, the, the my chart piece, is is the tool for that. We can communicate directly with patients and service users and people who've experienced, so so that they can give you know real time, experiential information that we can qualify and quantify. And and you, you're very right because we get numbers, but that doesn't tell the story. And, and we we need to be a bit smarter. But we, we will have outreach to all our patients who choose that tool. And I suppose we have to be very careful because it may only be. A certain section of the population that choose to use the tool, but but that will immeasurably improve on the qualitative data we currently have within health services. It's usually very small surveys and retrospective. Uh, we can do, now do very large services in real time or surveys in real time. Okay, okay, thank you. And the final one then from me is in relation to the there's considerable spend obviously needed now in the incoming financial year. Are there any issues in terms of the budget allocation for 2022-23 that are or could impact upon this work? Uh, well, we don't have a budget for 22-23, um, and we're I'm working through the implications of the, the position that we find ourselves in uh, departmentally uh, at the moment with my financial colleagues. Um, we are assuming at the minute uh, that uh, our going-in position is going to be our baseline from last year. Um, we have um, bid for additional monies um, that cover other programmes. Um, the Encompass programme is in, from both a capital and revenue perspective, um, the baseline allocation. Um, so, so I think from the Encompass perspective, we're in, we're in an OK place. Uh, but for the other key programmes, cyber security is one that we've talked about here today. Um, there is currently um, an issue with securing budget for those. Yeah, budget's, budget's a problem for all of us at the moment. <laughs> so, so, and you're working from a set of assumptions, and if, if, those, if those were to be incorrect, what would the potential impact be on delivery of Encompass? Uh, well, if there's no money, we'd have to stop the programme, I think, at a very simple level, but the, the, we're doing all of the work that we can to make sure that that is not an eventuality that we have to, have to deal with. Uh, and that, that's just a, a function of time and where we are in the year in order to establish an agreed upon budget for next year. Um, I agreed with our um, finance director yesterday that I'm going to um, write to our minister and just set out some of the kind of key high priority essential things that, um, that do need additional budget. Uh, and um, in doing that, set out what the business impact would be of not being able to fund those things next year. 
Okay. But it's, I mean, it's, it's very timely at the moment that we're all wrestling with what the budget position looks like for next year. Yeah, that's a, a massive worry, I have to say. Yep. OK, OK, listen, I want to thank both yourself, Dr Hughes, and yourself, Dan. Um, it, this, is, this is a really important element, of, element of, of work, and one, in fact, that we as a committee had indicated at the very outset we'd be hoping uh, to focus on and to work with you on. COVID has obviously challenged that in many ways, but um, it's, it's, it's unfortunate that we're, we have those delays, but it, we do look forward to your further information and to continued uh, good progress on this important piece of work. Thank you thank for you your questions and your yeah, support. Thank, thank you. you. Yeah, that's okay. very helpful. Thank you. Very thank you. Much. Thank you. Okay, folks. So yes, we can we can let you let you go. We thank carry you. on for the meeting. Thank you. Okay, members. So we'll continue on. We're still okay for yeah. So we'll continue on there, members, with with the next items of business. Um, so members, moving to SL one, regulation and improvement authority fees and frequency of inspections amendment regulations, 2022. I refer members to the clerk's memo at tab 7.1 of the pack, and to the SL one at tab 7.2. The Department is proposing to make a statutory rule to reduce the frequency of RQA inspections of dental practices from once every year to a minimum of once in every 24-month period. Um, do members have any comments in relation to that rule? No? Members broadly content that the Department makes the rule? Yeah. So I will put the, the question officially. Is the Committee content that the Department makes the statutory rule? Great. Yep. Committee are content. Thank you. Item 8 is SL1 uh, on the recovery of health services charges amounts amendment regulations 2022. I refer members to the clerk's memo at tab 8.1 of the pack and to the SL1 at tab 8.2. The department is proposing to make a statutory rule to apply an inflationary uplift to the current tariff levels of the scheme that provides for the collection. Excuse me of the costs incurred by hospitals in treating the casualties of road accidents. So that's one that I think we've seen now several times yeah. in, in committee. Do yeah. members have any comments they wish to make? No. Members, uh, is the committee content that the department makes the statutory rule? Yeah. Great. Thank you. SL1, in relation to the pharmaceutical services, amendment number two, regulations 2022. I refer members to the clerk's memo at tab 9.1 of the pack and to the SL1 at tab 9.2. The Department is proposing to make a statutory rule to amend and omit references to the Health and Social Care Board within the pharmaceutical regulations. The rule will not have any impact on the underpinning policy which governs the arrangements for the provision of pharmaceutical services. Any comments, members? No? Thank no. you, then. Is the Committee therefore content that the Department makes the statutory rule? Great. Committee content. Thank you. And item 10 on our agenda, then, is SL1. The Health and Personal Social Services General Medical Services Contracts Amendment Regulations NA 2022. I refer members to the Clerk's Memo at tab 10.1 of the pack and to the SL1 at tab 10.2. The Department is proposing to make a statutory rule to broaden the list of healthcare professionals permitted to prescribe in primary care. The Department advises that this is part of an ongoing programme to expand the number of non medical healthcare professions who may prescribe drugs as independent or supplementary prescribers to support multidisciplinary working and contribute to transforming how healthcare is delivered. So I suppose just from my own point of view on looking at this one, I, I actually would welcome this. I think it's, it's good that we see a kind of creative solutions around yeah. how we take pressure off certain parts of the system. I think it's also useful that we have a, a host of professionals out there, including nurses, um, paramedics, or a range of people who actually are very keen to uh, ensure that they have progression and, and we have too many of our nursing and our health and social care workforce currently working at the top of their band. So it's, it's good, I think, to see areas opening up and uh, relieving some of the pinch points and bringing more of those professional expertise to bear. Carol, are you looking to make a point on this? So is, uh, will it be a, a position that their responsibilities will be reflected in their salary 
because prescribing, I mean, you can't be a prescriber unless you're at a certain level, so we need to find that out. Yeah. Um, and we need to find, are they moving around their bands? And if they're not, it's a lot of responsibility. Yep, I think that's that's something that we do certainly need to clarify to ensure that that's being reflected um, in in the uh, additional responsibility should certainly be be uh, attracting um, that recognition in terms of pay, Colin. Yeah, sure, I think I agree with yourselves that, that this is a, probably a good idea because it sort of spreads the workload out. But I would maybe just have some concerns that it's actually putting additional pressures on some uh, professionals who are already equally. Um, you know, busy with their homework and what they're actually doing in the role as it is at the moment. Um, and I'm looking, for example, there, you know, like if we're talking about um, paramedics and prescribing, you know, does that then add additional workload and expectations on them whenever they go out to see patients and therefore it detains them longer at the scene, which then means that they're less able to provide the service? You know, it's almost like every bit that you move um, on, on the board in terms of health transformation will have an impact somewhere else. But in welcoming this, is there a way of just checking that that has been considered and thought through? Yep. So I'll just check with Claire. Can we can we, we, we can follow up on that? No correspond problem. on that in yeah. relation to that. Yep. So those concerns and our, our suggestions are, and concerns will be reflected. Um, okay. Pam, go ahead. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Um, I was just wondering. Um, obviously, this is going to impact on uh, and it will support multidisciplinary working, um, which is something we're really keen to see it rolled out in all areas of Northern Ireland, but. Could we also ask how many um, multidisciplinary teams are currently in place and, and ask with, if these changes will benefit the staff within these teams? Yep. Members content, we seek that information. Yeah. Yep. Yep, content. Okay, um, members, thank you. So, therefore, uh, in, 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 in the respect of the information we have asked for the Department to consider, in taking that on board, is the committee content the department makes the statutory rule? Great. Yep, thank you. Okay, members, so we are now going to move into closed session to consider the committee legacy report. So I'll ask the clerk just to bring us into closed session, please. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Signed.
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound.
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound.
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. Yep. Okay, members, so thank you. And uh, we are moving on then to item 12, uh, uh, which is in relation to correspondence. And I want to draw members' attention to several items today. First of all, um, item 12.4 there is an update on the implementation of the elective cure framework. Um, do members have any comments on this? I thought it was light on detail, to be quite honest, and I think actually we should Agreed. almost seek further detail and breakdown in relation to that mm -hmm. framework. Um, would members be content, or any other comments? Great. Yeah, members content with that. Thank you. Great. Yeah. Um, item 12.07 is correspondence from the Minister advising the Committee of the Publication of the Independent Review into Failings at Dunmurray Manor Care Home. Do members have any comments in relation to that item? No? Members content to note? Yeah. Yep, thank you. Do members have any... Uh, uh, Go so ahead, Paula. I appreciate the, thank you, Chair. I appreciate the, the update, I suppose. In some ways, there's a frustration that we're getting so close to the end of the... Uh, the mandate that we can't actually, you know, get our TIA and others in to actually start interrogating this. So it's 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 good to have it, but I think that we we could, in the next mandate, hopefully, really get back to this issue properly. Okay, thank you. Um, do members have any comments to make in relation to any other particular items of correspondence in the main pack? I'm going to take several from the table pack as well. But are members otherwise content to note the actions on the correspondence memo? Yeah, sure. I'm just trying to go from table pack to. Correspondence. It's around the neurology stuff as well. I want to raise, um, but it might be under AOB. Um, okay. Yeah. Okay. okay. We'll, we'll take it in AOB then. Okay. Thank um, you. So, member, in terms of table papers, table papers correspondence, there's a couple of items there I'd like to draw members' attention to. A tab 12.33 of the table pack. We have correspondence from the Royal College of Nurses stating that it believes that the safety of patients in emergency departments across the north can no longer be assured. I have to say that's a very, very worrying letter from the RCN, and and this is this is from the front line, you know, and this is a warning that we cannot afford to uh, underestimate and and to act upon. We are due to hear from the RCN at our meeting on the 24th of March. However, would members agree that we urgently write to, to the department and the trusts for an urgent response to yeah. this letter? Yeah. And are there any other comments in relation to the letter that people want to make, Paula? Thank you. I suppose in some ways written correspondence is one thing, but for them to actually get the departmental officials to sit down with RCN and actually see if there's any very quick, robust actions. Because as you say, we just we can't let this go just from a letter to a letter. I think. Yep. 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 Uh, members agree. Pam, you were looking to come in on this issue as well, I think. Yeah, Chair, and I, I think I would maybe even take it a, a step further from Paulus and, and maybe suggest if at all possible, I know we're really tight for time, but if we could even have a, um, a, a dedicated session, we actually ask the department to meet with us to discuss this letter in its entirety. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Members, members agreed, and, and that is. Yep. Okay. And I think that does reflect the seriousness of the situation that we're hearing from from the RCN. Um, Colin, go ahead. Yeah. Sure, it's just maybe on the back of it, uh, you know, of course, our, our role in, in going to the minister is, is critical and important, but maybe just to get the feedback, what's the normal turnaround time for a response? Because we've only got two weeks left, um, you know, in the sense that of us being able to, to hold the minister to account on this in, in terms of the department rather than the individual minister. But um, th these issues are these issues are massive uh, and, you know, they're being amplified just from the front line. And if we simply write a letter, you know, I don't know if we're actually cutting it in terms of our role. So totally agree with what Pam has said. You know, we really need somebody in front of us to have a conversation about this. And and in reality, we've only got Thursday fortnight to do it because I don't think we're in next Thursday. Yeah, and yeah, so I'll check with Clark in terms of turnaround times. Turnaround time for responses. Normally we request 10 working days for urgent. We can reduce that um, and we would do in this case. Generally, the trusts are quite good in responding um, quite quick, but certainly if members wish, we can have a look at um, schedules over the next, um, certainly try next week or early the following week to try and identify yeah. a, a time and date. Yeah, could I come in? I th I'm yeah. thinking um, just because of the urgency of it, even if we could, if it needs to be, you know, like an evening meeting or whatever, but if we can just get the point across that we need to come together, we're requesting officials 
um, and obviously the, the groups involved and the health committee with our support, an urgent meeting, even if it's during the day, but maybe an evening one might suit better with the members in the chamber. Yep, um, and given pressure, yeah, given pressure in the chamber. That go ahead, Paul. Uh, thank you. For let me back in. I suppose there, there's one thing the minister and his officials, but there's also then the chief executives of the trust. And I don't want a massive meeting, but in terms of urgent response, I think the CEOs of the trust would be necessary for that meeting too. Okay. Okay. Thank you, members. Um, have members any further comments on items within the table pack? And. No, I just want to make then, members, there are a number of outstanding items of correspondence. There's almost somewhere between 60 and 70 items of outstanding correspondence from the Department. Are members content that we write to the Department to request to make every effort to answer those questions before the end of this mandate? Yeah. And they've been with them for an extended period of time in many yeah. cases. Right. Yep. Great. Members content. Thank you. Okay, yeah. member. Yes, go ahead, Pam. Yeah, sure. I was just to say, or to check through the clerk there, I mean, presumably, if all that corresponds, and if it's unanswered at the end of the mandate, simply just falls away. It doesn't. It doesn't remain in place or anything. Yes, that, that's correct, Pam. Yep. So yep. I, I suppose then, given some of it may be very important, and you, you would like to think it would be uh, answered eventually, is there any way of um, even putting into that legacy report something around the correspondence to ensure that anything that's really critical and not is actually resubmitted or asked again. Okay, we'll ask the clerk to take a look at that at, as to as to how that could be um managed. Yep. Okay. I just I just don't think it's good if we've like, sixty pieces of correspondence. We've we've written on all those issues for very important reasons. Um and just to let it fall away it just seems to be um wrong. <laughs> so I would like to think we could maybe make efforts to ensure that the issues are raised again if they are going to fall away and not be answered. Yeah. No, I absolutely agree. And, and actually, even even if they are answered now, some of them will have been a uh, timeliness will have been an issue with them. And it's regrettable that the answers will be coming through late. But I think you're right. I think we need to absolutely every one of those pieces of correspondence was considered. And we only ever wrote to the department on issues that we thought were of significant concern. So so each of them individually are, are important correspondence. Yep. Okay, thank you. So, members, moving on to the Forward Work Programme, then. I refer members to the Forward Work Programme at tab 13.1 of the pack. Are members content to note the Forward Work Programme? And given that, that the clerk now has a further piece of work to do yeah. in, in trying to restructure everything that we're dealing with, Paula? Thank you, Chair. I, I just want to put on record how disappointed I am that we're not going to get a, an update from the Department of Health on the commissioning of abortion services. I thought we would have got, received that within the timescale of the end of March, so just want that noted. Thank you, Paula. Okay, members content to note the forward work programme and then moving on to any other business. And I know Carol you had indicated. Yeah. So I think everyone has raised concerns around the correspondence from the department. I mean there are massive items. And my kind of concern would be that some of those items that the committee asked for are going to fall if they're not answered and may not be picked up. Um, and one of the things that we've been very consistent about um, certainly is around, and Paul has mentioned the abortion services, um, but certainly around the um, neurology inquiry, if there is a plan for that inquiry, because I mean, my understanding was the report would have been out and all. Um, so just to try and even ask the inquiry itself, when does it anticipate themselves to be reported? But we're still waiting on word back from the department. They made a statement some months ago saying there'd be redress schemes and re and then there was recall schemes and recall and several a, a few recalls and uh, it's it's now it feels like um whatever was announced, there's no tracking or following up on it because we're not getting the information. So I think even just to top and tail that is one thing. Sir, I want to go just back. Before, before you, yeah. is, is it another issue you're going back to? Uh, completely. Yeah. So uh, just, just in relation to neurology, I also would like to add to that the uh, the 
The review of RQIA into the deceased patients has yes. not been, and I think that needs to be urgently followed up as to, for a date as to when that report is going to be published. Yes. That's an outstanding item of business in neurology as well. So my next item was on RQIA. RQIA okay. have done several reports, including neurology, but others. Yep. So okay, go ahead then. Yep. So ahead, can we Karen. can we get the because it isn't just while well, getting the, the word from the department is critical. Th these papers are independent and looking at things that went wrong and things, particularly in the pandemic. Yep. So can we just get, because Paul is right, or whoever raised it, we won't get them in front of the committee. So can we get almost a, a legacy report from the RQIA? And then, Chair, I want to go on to something else completely different, my last point. Okay. Um, so we'll just check with Clark. Do you have specific items that you want RQIA to respond to? Well, or? I mean, the issue, we looked at the Muckamore and the Murray home. We've also got the car homes in respite during COVID, and we've got the RQI report into the deceased patients who were under the care at the time of Michael Watt. Uh, whatever other issues that RQI have been asked to report on from January 2020 until March 2022, we need, we need those topped and tailed. Yep. Thank you. And then the other item then of, of so, it Chair, I, I, it was just looking at the Encompass presentation, and for the life of me, I can't understand that any um, uh, initiative that's given substantial amounts of public money, you know, four eight five point nine million, is asking for additional bids for cyber security. I, I mean, I have to say, I think that's bonkers. You would imagine it would be built into the original business case. So it says version 2.54 of the full business case. I don't even understand what a 2.54 version is. It's either two <laughs> one, or two, or three. three. Yeah. Like. So, I, I, and I'm not being pernickety here, but I want to find out why. That's why I asked about the procurement commission and tendering. Why then is there additional bids in the Department of Cybersecurity? Why was that not built into the original? Because it's not like cybersecurity just happened a couple of weeks ago. So, and I do think that's, to be honest, that that's not good accounting, and it's not good practice in terms of commission and procurement. Um, and the, the other aspect of it is, is the whole cost and the budget approved in the full business case. Is there any optimum bias built into that, in terms of contingencies and whatever else? And the, the uh, I think it was. I can't even say, is it Dan? Dan, yeah. Daniel Dan mentioned several bids. He mentioned one about cyber security. I didn't hear him mention the others. What was the other bids he's putting in the department for? Shanae, yep. I'm not good. Can Mem you? Members agree that we seek those pieces yeah. of clarification? Yep. OK, thank you, um, members. And then Alan, I have indicating for an item of any other business. Go ahead, Alan, please. Sorry, Chair, I was having difficulty there on mute. Uh, uh, Chair, I just uh, beg your indulgence uh, under any other business to uh, bring up the subject of the uh, private members that we're going through at the moment uh, in relation to the preservation of uh, historic documents. Um, and uh, just would, would be seeking the support of, of the committee uh, for the accelerated passing mechanism to be deployed here. Um, I can't speak to it and the rationale and reasons for it, if, if you wish, Mr. Chair. Um, is that, Clerk, is that, is that appropriate that we, we take that right now, or do we need to schedule that in for? For the. For Alan was going to outline the reasons. No, he, well, can, he can outline the he reasons, outline no problem. Reasons. Yep. And, and then, can you see what other steps need to be taken to, to ensure that the committee. That the process is correct. Well, the, the, the process just requires Alan to outline to the committee um, the reasons. Okay. It's then down to the committee to decide whether it wishes to take a position or not. Do we have to take that decision today? No. 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 Okay. So what I propose then is, Alan, if you set out the reasons, take the opportunity to set out the reasons, and uh, we can then consider that. So back to yourself, Alan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, the pressure of documents are an important task of the victims of this scandal. Unfortunately, it was impossible to add legislation compulsion on organisations to preserve documents that require or indeed may wish to be accessed by victims 
in the Adoption and Children's Bill. Now, a lot of these documents are stored in very, very poor conditions and are deteriorating, and some quite old. Uh, and much of the documents held by institutions may contain information that could prove it. It's absolutely vital that they are preserved. Now, the bill was considered to be the only mechanism available to secure legislation before the end of this mandate, and perhaps even for some time into the future. And so it has only been with the sympathy of the Speaker uh, and the support of the Business Committee and Party Whips that it has been possible to at least create a hope uh, that legislation could be put in place now. Accelerated passage can ensure that we can produce legislation before the end of the, the, the mandate, the, this mandate. And I would respectfully ask the committee uh, to support uh, this uh, initiative. Uh, as it is, it's fully supported by the department and fully supported by uh, victims, victims groups, and their families. Thank you. Okay, thank you for that uh, for that information, Alan. And then we can return to to a future consideration on that. So, members, I think that's uh, everything then for today. And I want to thank members for for what has been a very important and a, and a really, really a. Uh, enjoyable session in, in a sense but also a very very focused and a very I, I believe will be looking back seen as, as a very important um, one in terms of the uh, the input of the disabled people's parliament and the, the fantastic contribution that, that that made to our meeting today and hopefully as, as, a, as a part of shaping the future uh, delivery and, and design and delivery of health and social care, which we're all so passionately interested in, and uh, just to once again thank them for, for their time today. Thank you, members. Our next meeting will be on uh, 12.30 on Tuesday, 15th of March, in Room 30, when we will have briefings from the Chief Dental Officer and the Health and Social Care Board on the provision of GP and dental services. Thank you, members. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed.